control Shoveling dirt in every hole Predators to condemn your soul Watching you and watching me We're all connected but separated Misunderstood and so frustrated A million armies of one have invaded Watching you and watching me To make headlines be immortalized Everyone's got an electric eye with the digital spies Little brother Standing by to dethrone each other Watching you and watching me Paranoid, the lens is our weapon Desensitized in our lust for attention Democratized by our boyer obsessions Watching you and watching me Slips to perfection Don't let them project you as you are To make headlines be immortalized Everyone's got an electric guy with the digital spies Stay in line, don't make a mistake We're watching
let your experience begin right now. From high atop the mountains of British Columbia to you listening around the world, this is Spaced Out Radio. You can follow us on our website, spacedoutradio.com, on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. You can follow us on Instagram, Dave Scott, S-O-R, or on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. Buckle up, space travelers. It's time to go for a ride as we are live on Spaced Out Radio. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Space Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, and it's good to have you along for the ride wherever you are on this great planet we call Earth. We are live right here in Uncle Jimbo's cabin, right here in the Great White North on this Friday night, early Saturday morning, if you're on the East Coast. Let's welcome in everyone listening in on SpaceOutRadio.com, on Spreaker, on the United Public Radio Network, the High Plains Talk Radio Network, and on Revolution Radio. We do this thing every night of the week as we rock in and out of every show thanks to our resident guitar god mr ron bumblefoot thal formerly of guns and roses yes bumblefoot is the official sound of sor if you're on social media buzzing around you can follow me on twitter at spaced out radio give our facebook page a like spaced out radio show on instagram i can be followed at dave scott sor subscribe to our youtube channel spaced out radio show find us on tune in download this show and others on itunes and our website is spaced out radio.com hey if you're listening in and you want to take part in the show what you have to do is you have to sign into one of the chat rooms either on revolution radio on spreaker on the united public radio network chat room or on facebook at the sor space travelers club or if you're on twitter what you need to do is just go to hashtag Spaced Out Radio. I'll get your questions there as well. On our website, if you haven't signed up for the SOR Space Travelers Club yet, do me a favor. It's time. It equates to about 5 bucks a month. With that, your name gets entered into monthly prize drives. You get access to private group interviews, access to a special section on our website, and so much more. While on our website, you can also read up on my latest blog. Check up on Eric Markham's SOR Space Wire for your latest and weird news. And if you've had an experience you can't explain, Head to the SOR Sightlines Report. Researcher Mike Schmidt is ready to find out what's going on with you. At this time, we want to welcome in everyone listening in on the United Public Radio Network, live on 107.7 FM in New Orleans and over 160 countries around the world. And remember, if you're a listener on Revolution Radio... Remember, the Double R Machine is the largest non-profit online radio station going today. Do us a favor. Visit freedomslips.com and donate today. Tonight we are going to go right out of the ordinary, looking at a paranormal experiment that dates back almost five decades in trying to not only communicate with the dead, but to test the living on their own limitations when it comes to the sixth sense. The Gansfeld experiment is rooted from the German translation for entire field. It's a technique used in parapsychology which claims to be able to test individuals for extrasensory perception, or ESP. The Gansfield experiments are among the most recent in parapsychology for testing telepathy. For the next couple of hours, Craig Weiler will join us. He writes a blog called The Weiler Psy, where he writes about everything revolving around parapsychology, journalism, to living with psycho, uh, pardon me, psychic ability. 
When it comes to testing for the truth, Craig is one of those researchers who looks for the hard answers as to whether or not something is valid or just folklore. In hour number three tonight, we're going to be joined by the E3. Eric, Eric, and Everett will join me to continue the paranormal talk in hour number three. So here we go. Craig Weiler, thank you so much for being on Space Out Radio tonight. How are you? I'm fine, Dave. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to, it's a pleasure to be on the show with you. It's an absolute pleasure to have you as well, because the one thing that when you do this show, and we've been doing this for just over two years now, is we're trying to come up with some really cool topics for discussion that we've never talked about in the first two years. The Gansfeld experiment is definitely one of them, Craig, because there is so much about it, we're going to get into it heavily tonight, that is just purely strange. And you have to wonder if... MK Ultra was involved, if other scientific experiments that the government was putting on was involved. But before we get into all of that, what led you down this strange path for where you decided that you needed to investigate all of these topics further? Um, you know, it, it's an interesting thing. In, about, in 2008, blogs were just starting to be a thing. And uh, I went on I started blogging because I've always been, I've always loved writing and I just blogs were natural for me because I'm a, the type of person who can write in a couple thousand words and, you know, really wrap up a topic in a short time. So it, it was like ideal for me to finally have an audience. And so I started on politics and I wrote about other things, but you know, politics has a bazillion people in it. It's, um, and everybody's got an opinion and it's not really, uh, I didn't feel like I was contributing anything. And so I started writing a little bit about psychic experiences on a site called The Daily Cost, which is uh, political, but they also allow other topics. And I got all this horrible feedback from skeptics who, you know, basically it's like, no, 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 this stuff's all crap, yada, 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 yada. And why don't you take the Randy's Million Dollar Challenge? And so I investigated the challenge. I started looking into it and read what other people had written about it. And I realized this, this million dollar challenge was not really scientific. It didn't really prove anything. Uh, it, the experiments were questionable. And then I put that out there and I got more flack from these people. And it was like, these are skeptics. They're supposed to think about this stuff. They're supposed to, you know, kind of get it in their mind to look at both sides and whatnot. And they're clearly wrong here. And it's very easy to prove them wrong about this challenge. What's going on here? And so I, and so I had broken through the first barrier there of, I don't believe the skeptics. And that's, that's really what started me on the journey is they need to be questioned. So what is the evidence here? Is there science? Is, is Randy's million dollar challenge the only thing out there? And so I began investigating and investigating and investigating. And this whole thing led me down a, a tremendously deep rabbit hole. Because once you start questioning the skepticism, then you have to check and double check everything. Uh, and the Gunsfeld experiments was one of the first things that I ran across where I began to test this, what the skeptics said against what I could actually research. And I kept pushing at that because, okay, this person says this about the gun style. What do the skeptics say? Well, the skeptics have an answer for that. Okay, what about this? Well, the skeptics have an answer for that. What about this? Well, the skeptics have an answer for that. What about that? The skeptics don't have an answer. And, um, when when I was looking into the guns felt, it was, uh, what I discovered was the skeptics started the the farther I in I got into looking into into it, the more it was obvious that the skeptics were brushing over things and not looking at them clearly. So I said, okay, is there anything about the guns felt where the skeptics have definitively nailed this experiment to the wall and and did de de demonstrated that it's absolutely no good? And the answer was no. They couldn't do it. There was nothing there where it was definitive that the skeptics were able to knock it down. And so I started looking at other experiments and other experiments, and I kept blogging on this. Uh, eventually, I moved from daily cost to my own blog because I was, 
uh, I was just, uh, I needed a place for people to be able to comment without getting a ration of crap. The, the skeptics were really nasty to them. And then I continued my blog for, for many years and, until the last year. I finally just ran out of stuff there, and it, it wasn't really growing anymore. So I moved over to a site called Quora, where now I can answer questions from different people. And um, I, I'm getting a lot more views, and uh, I'm getting more people following me, and it's, it's been a lot more interesting there. So that's, that's kind of where it took. It was just from about 2009 to about 2015, it was blogging quite a bit, constantly pulling up new stuff about the research and comparing it uh, to my own psychic abilities, which that brings up one more point was when I looked at the, the uh, evidence and I looked at the skeptics, one of the reasons that I, that I questioned the skeptics so much is that I already knew about psychic ability uh, from my own experiences, so I would ask the, so I would ask myself, uh, rather than how are these experiments wrong? It's how are these right? And how, why do, um, you know, people tend to take the skeptics at their word, but I was taking the researchers at their word, so I was kind of flipping this around, uh, and this, the result is the skeptics had to prove their points, and when they have to prove their points they don't do as well. Uh, and that was, that was kind of how this journey started. It just kept questioning skeptics. And, you know, for your own personal self, Craig, were you going through a transformation of sorts as well as you started looking into yourself, the more you researched this? I know with myself, when all of my experiences started happening five years ago now, I really had to take a look at who I was. Did you go through that same parameter with yourself as well? Uh, no. I already had a, a fairly strong sense of self in terms of my psychic abilities. I had been, uh, I had gone to classes with a psychic, I'd experimented with stuff at, uh, during the whole huge New Age movement thing. Uh, because I live in the Bay Area, I was at ground zero for all of that. And so for quite a while, I was surrounded by psychics. Uh, but I did have a very profound experience when I started researching, and that was I got furiously angry because all this information that was so valuable and so validating was being kept from me. That pissed me off. I was angry at that. I mean, holy crap. This, this information, this all this science demonstrating that psychic ability is real, that the stuff that validates that also validates me as a person because the science isn't anything like what they're, what we're being told. There's all this stuff that's been discovered that, that we need if we're, if we're psychic because it validates us. It tells us we're normal. Everything about what we're, you know, what we're doing is, uh, is perfectly part of physics and reality. We're, we're not outliers. We're not doing something bizarre. And so that was my reaction. Anger. Lots of it. A good point was brought up by Eric Cooper in the SOR Space Travelers Club when you were talking about skeptics. Basically said, it's amazing how quickly skeptics get so upset when you contradict anything that they believe, and you, they don't have an explanation. It really is funny to watch, isn't it? Oh, my gosh, yes. Um, I, I will occasionally, I mean, this is a bad habit, but I love baiting them, uh, just, just kind of throwing something out there and just proving them about three or four times in a row until they work themselves up into a froth just to see them squirm. Um, it's a bad habit, but, you know, it's, it's kind of a little sport. It demonstrates to me what, you know, that really they're on a really deep emotional level about this. Why do you think the skeptics get so upset? I've had that battle many a time. I think anybody in this field has had that battle with the people who don't believe. In fact, earlier today I had a situation with a phone call where someone was like, I guess you knew I'd be calling. And I was like, no, it doesn't quite work that way. 
You know what I'm saying? There's always that that one person who has to get in that snide shot or get upset because you're trying to provide information. Yes. Um, so I I did write a book where I researched this heavily. It's um, Psy Wars, TED, Wikipedia, and the Battle for the Internet. And I uh, did a lot of research on the skeptics because this they are of interest to me. Uh, and what I discovered is this is an authoritarian personality. Uh, and in their, uh, their, and part of that is that they, uh, they've, they're wired so that they're overly left brained, which creates some personality problems for them. And, uh, one of the things that they've discovered from people who have, uh, right side strokes, which, uh, I'm sorry, which, left side strokes, which means that the right side of their brain has been, um, has gotten the stroke so that they're relying heavily on their uh, left brain abilities because the, the right brain controls the left side. So anyway, when they, when they have that problem and they and they don't have the right brain capabilities, they become incredibly linear. Uh, and it's, it's scary how, how many things in common they have with skeptics is that, uh, they follow logic way too closely. They have, uh, a, an inability to think holistically, uh, which is something that you see in skeptics, an inability to handle ambiguity, which is something you see in skeptics, and uh, a high level of frustration when they cannot follow their logical path. As long as they're directly on their own path, they're comfortable, but when you take them out of their comfort zone, they don't have a mechanism for stepping back and dealing with that, and so they get upset. It's the same thing the stroke victims do. They just they get, they get upset because they can't they can't follow it, uh, and there, there's agitation because they're missing something. It, it's um, you know they they typically have very little sense of humor. They have an inability to laugh at themselves, um, and they tend to be they tend not to see hypocritical their own hypocritical behavior and they get very, very angry. If you point it out to them, you'll never hear a skeptic say, Oh God, my bad. You know, they just, they can't do that. They're um, it's uh, it's, it's a fundamentalist type personality. I think Eric Markham in this spaced out radio chat room on Spreaker has a good point here. He says, what are we calling skeptics these days? or pardon me, what we are calling skeptics these days are really misnamed. A true skeptic will accept change based on evidence. Uh, yeah, absolutely, they will. I, I run into about uh, one in every 30 or so uh, that, that actually is open uh, and a true skeptic. But for the most part, I mean, the people that identify as skeptics, it's almost a guarantee that they're going to have these behavior problems. It's, it's almost a guarantee. You, you have to be careful for that, like, 5% or whatever that's a true skeptic. But, no, they're actually true believers. Uh, they, they're, you can tell they're, they're all atheists. So you have atheism associated very, very strongly with, with uh, skepticism which indicates that you have a, a whole belief system that goes along with it. Uh, in fact, this is, if you go back to uh, the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, which used to be uh, the CSI, uh, COP, um, they are actually, uh, they're, they're act they actually have a sister organization that's a humanist, atheist organization, uh, and this goes back to like the 1950s, and that, that has never changed. So what you're basically looking at with them is true believers, only they're atheists, so they don't call themselves true, true believers, because part of their dogma is that they're not a religion and they're, they're a non-belief. Uh, but in actuality, of course, it's, it's not that way. Let's get into the Gansville experiment here. Let's learn okay. what, it, what it is all about, because we're going to have a whole lot to talk about. We've only got you for another hour and 40 minutes, and trust me, that will burn right through on the timeline. The Gansfield mm -hmm. Experiment, I believe, came up in 1970. Tell us about why it was created and what it's all about, Craig. 
Well, this, the uh, Gunstelt was created by uh, parapsychologist Charles Onerton, uh, drawing on previous experiments. You, you really can't find anything in parapsychology or, or most sciences that don't draw on something previous. And what he did was he took, um, he took a very simple type experiment uh, where you have one person in one room and another person in another room. The first person sends an image and the second person has to choose from four images which one is the right one. So right away, you know what chance is, uh, which is very important because parapsychology is a statistical science. They rely on statistics to find out uh, whether they're successful. And in order to be successful in parapsychology, you have to beat chance. So the chance result in a, in a Gonsfeld experiment is always 25%. In other words, if you can only pick one in four, you're, do, you're only doing chance. You, you, you haven't accomplished anything. And so what made these experiments particularly interesting was that Charles Onerton teamed up with Ray Hyman, uh, just a, a total, complete, 100% skeptic. And Hyman had a crack at, at looking at these experiments and, con and continually made comments as to what could possibly be wrong with them. And so over the course of, of I think, about a decade there, they were going back and forth, and, uh, and Honorton would do some experiments, and uh, Hyman would go, no, they, you know, there could be smudge marks on the photographs and, you know, the right one got handled too much and people can tell or, you know, there's, there's this spot where maybe they can transfer information between each other. Maybe they're collaborating. And so they kept tightening up the experiment uh, as they were going until finally there weren't really very many objections. And so with the skeptic, in this, partic in this particular case with, with Hyman, the the experiment got uh, refined right away. Uh, and eventually they had this, this new thing called computers where they were able to send the image digitally. So you had randomization as well. And now the experiment didn't have a lot of human handling in order to make, uh, in order to make it go, which took out a, a method of possible cheating all you you know, as long as the program was working correctly, everything was going to be okay. Uh, and I should say one of the one of the reasons they call it the Gansfeld or total field is because the receiver has they they cut a uh, ping pong ball in half and they stick these two halves over their eyes, so all they can see is blurred vision. And then they put like white noise over their ears. So when you see the the, the typical Gonstelt pictures is somebody with headphones on and these ping pong balls over their, taped over their eyes. And the idea is that this person can't really receive any uh, definitive stimulus from their environment, so they're more likely to pick up something psychically. And so that's, that's the basic premise of the Gonstelt experiment. This person gets into a total field of not really being, being able to hear or see anything else. So without the distractions, they can pick up more psychic information. So they ran these experiments, and they get results of about 30 to 33%, which with chance of 25%, there's clearly an anomaly here. And they're going... Um, they continue these experiments and they continue them and they keep refining them. They automate them. And so it was now called the automated Gonsfeld. Uh, and they kept getting 33%. Other people would try it and they get between 30 and 33%. And this, this kept going like through the eighties, they, more people kept doing this and the results were around 30 to 33% or so. Uh, and so you had this experiment, which, was getting a very typical result, which was unusual for parapsychology because they, uh, they have a lot of trouble uh, getting things to, to replicate on a regular basis and have everybody on the same page replicating. Part of the problem with parapsychology is it's a very tiny field. So there's, there's a lot of different experiments done, but there hadn't been a whole lot of replication of things except for... Um, I think around the same time they were doing the RNG experiments, 
um, and uh, some other things. But this one, this one got this gun stuff got a lot of replication from a lot of people, and we started you started to build this larger database. And that's pretty much what makes the Gonsfeld significant. It's not the experiment itself. It's just that a lot of people have done it. Did they find more success with men versus women or the other way around? Or was it generic to each and every person? Um, some people are definitely better than others. Uh, typically, I think about... Uh, Two thirds of the psychic people are women, so they're they're generally going to have more success uh, with women overall. Uh, they they there are certain um, characteristics that they look for in finding a good pair, and that's what they're looking for is a pair. And they'll typically go with people that already have some sort of a connection. Relatives work better. Uh, twins, of course, blow everybody else out of the water. You know, we're talking about identical twins, and um, but mothers and children and you know husbands and spouses and things like this. These these pairs work well, uh, as opposed to two strangers who are more likely to get a um, a no result. Uh, and then there are also different personality types, and also it this gets this this gets really involved because not only do you have different personality types that work better with it. Um, the, uh, using the MBTI, uh, basically, uh, uh, in, people who internalize, uh, who have a rich inner life are going to do better. And, uh, if they're, if they're introverts, then you need to make their results private. And if they're extroverts, you make their results public. Uh, and because this is how these people deal with their rewards, uh, and they they handle it better. And then, some experimenters are better than others. Uh, so you'll have some people who can never get results ever on a psi experiment and other people who can get them all the time. It's, uh, it's interesting. Psychic ability is a, a really difficult field and um, more power to the people that explore this area because it's, it's a challenging one. But getting back to the Gunsfeld, it's, it's definitely the replications that make this interesting. There's like 4,000 uh replication studies that they can draw from now as well as uh, as well as they've been done by like 50 different researchers and 108 different uh, uh, peer-reviewed journals. So there's a lot of data now to work from. Uh, and the skeptics have just not been able to knock this one down. They, they try, but there's, there's really, there's not much for them to grab. What about when it comes to children? Is there an age where a child should not be tested, or is there an age where we're starting to see children build on their intuitive abilities, especially if they have supportive parents who really proclaim loudly that I'm not going to change my child's intuition just because society or school or friends or religion tells me to do so? Uh, You know... Of all the things that I've run into from the Gunsfeld, I've never run into uh, anything that had to do with children or how they fare in the Gunsfeld. There's just no information there that I'm aware of. There might be something, I just haven't run into it. Uh, there are other telepathy studies with children. Um, Diane Powell had a recent one, and this is, uh, she uh, was testing an autistic child. I think she's done a couple of them now. The results are way beyond the guns felt way beyond any other telepathy experiment. They're like this this kid is 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 hitting like was was hitting like nearly a hundred percent. I mean, we're talking full telepathy, uh, and um, that was you know like being able to telepathy pick, telepathically pick out a ten digit number that kind of thing. Uh, really remarkable stuff, but not the Gonsfeld. I, I, I just don't know anything. I, I haven't heard of any children being involved with it. So what do they do to determine whether or not someone is psychic? Um, well, they don't actually look at people to decide whether they're psychic, they, but they look at whether they're a good candidate for the experiment. Um, 
And so what they're looking for are people who are uh, internal. In other words, like I said, with the, with the rich inner life, they're, they're looking for people in, in a basic personality group. Uh, if you're looking at the MBTI, uh, Myers-Briggs Type Index, uh, INFJ, INFP, um, all the, basically the NFs in there, and uh, in, introverted, uh, or you can be an introvert or an expert or an extrovert, but um, you have to be, um, you know, kind of in the intuitive range. So they can test, they can they, they can use the uh, MBTI type index to get a little bit closer, and then then they can also ask people about their experiences and stuff. Uh, but that's that's pretty much the you know the range of it. They're looking for a specific kind of personality area. So take us through the test. Does someone lie down on a on a bed or are they sitting in a relaxed chair like they would at a psychiatrist's office? Take us through the the test from start to finish. Okay. Um well typically they'll only do one or two a day. Uh this is really strange, but they have something there there's something called local sidereal time where your uh where your 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 time is not based on uh our normal clock or rhythm, but rather what the stars are doing. Uh and when I think it's when the galaxy is slightly above the horizon, uh psychic ability increases dramatically. I have no idea why this is just completely bizarre stuff, but then they'll do the one or two experiments during this time. And they don't do a lot of experiments because partly because repetition um, tends to diminish the effect. People get bored. So they only do a couple of them a day. It's a very slow experiment. Uh, Anyway, you'll have uh, one person in one room that's electromagnetically shielded and another person someplace else in a room that's electromagnetically shielded. Shielded. The receiver sits, lays back. Uh, they're in a they're they're in a reclined position. They have the headphones on. They have the the ping pong balls over their eyes, and they're just there to receive. And then they have um, they have you know a speaker so that they can they can talk and describe and and also um, you know communicate with somebody so that they can can tell them okay you know start what do you see talk it out and you know maybe and then then they'll also be shown uh the four images which they get afterwards which they get to pick the sender is in a more of alert state they get the actual picture that they're working from and work to send that image uh so really it's it's very basic as long once you've controlled for sound and sight uh the controls are that's all. That's all you need to control for sound and sight. The rest is trying to make the experiment uh, as conducive to eliciting a, a psychic response as possible. Uh, and and the uh, the images the the image that the sender gets is uh, picked randomly. This is not. And this is this is used with a scientific randomizing desi- device. Um, it's not pseudo randomized. By, by an algorithm, but rather they it's, it uses a true random signal, which which they draw from um, s- small radioactive charges from a stable radioactive element, and then they they get their randomization from that, and then that device tells that device gives the true random randomization so that you can have the pictures truly randomized, so that you know that it's so that you know that you have true random on this side. And then you're controlled for um, <clears throat> not having any problems associated with pseudo randomization on the other side. And uh, you know the person they they run this experiment maybe two or you know two or so a day, and then at the end maybe they've done a a big study would be like a hundred of these trials, uh, and then they go at the end and they start crunching the numbers and seeing what they got. What's the red light used for? Um, to, to, as far as I know, the red light is just a way to 
uh, had a dim, dimly lit atmosphere for the um, for the for the receiver, so that they don't they're so, so that they don't have a lot of bright light in their eyes. Red light is easier to for the eye to work with. It doesn't, um, uh, you know, it's like they use red light. You use a red light when you don't want to disturb your night vision. That kind of thing. Fully it's, understand. It's not, yeah. Uh, and, you know, a lot of psychic people, for example, are blue-eyed. And um, with blue eyes, the, the brighter the light, the more it disturbs you. I, I, blue-eyed people don't really, you know, it's like they don't like lights in their eyes. It's, it's more irritating. Mm-hmm. What were people saying the results were? Because I have heard in my research through this that not only were they trying to improve on their psychic communication or ability, but they were trying to improve on some sort of paranormal communication as well with spirits on the other side. Was that being noted as well? Um, that is not the Gansfeld. That is remote viewing. Uh, the um, in remote viewing, they have definitely done that. They did it in the star uh, the Stargate experiments and uh, in different types of things. But remote viewing allows you to get out there and explore these different things. The Gansfeld is a much more controlled scientific experiment where you're trying to find a particular um, particular. You know, you're picking one photo out of four. There isn't a lot of room for um, uh, for exploration. It's it, it it's just it's strictly a scientific experiment. Were scientists taking this seriously? Because so much in the whole parapsychology field, we notice and we see mainstream scientists absolutely putting the kibosh to anything that is of the paranormal. Yeah, scientists. Um, when we when you say scientists, what you're actually talking about are the highly skeptical um, evangelical atheist subset. They are so noisy that they and and they're so determined to present themselves as we are science that it's that 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 you don't get to hear the other voices. Uh, in the scientific community. But if you poll these people privately, um, I think something like 40 or 50 percent of scientists are, are completely open to psychic ability. And why wouldn't they be? A lot of people experience it. It's not that big a deal. So when Charles Honerton was conducting these experiments between 74 and 82, I'm surprised he only did 42 during that period. If you want results, isn't it to do as many tests as possible to prove without a shadow of a doubt that the more numbers, the the easier it would be to get that mainstream acceptance? Yes, but it's a very slow experiment, and it's an expensive one. Uh, it, does, it requires two electromagnetically shielded rooms. It requires your computer set up. Um, like I said, you can only do you know two or three uh, trials a day. And parapsychology requ- uh, relies on private funding. So they... You know they're they're working off of donations, and there's only so much they can they can accomplish that way. Uh, so they end up having a lot of smaller studies instead of some really gargantuan big ones. They just the the, the money just isn't there. That's really the the thing that holds it back. You, you fast forward to 2016, and they've got like 7,000 trials by now, and 4,000 of them are or so are replication. So the numbers are there now. There's, there's no question. Uh, but back when uh, Arnerton was doing it back then, he's like the, you know, one of like two or three people doing it. They just, they just couldn't build the numbers. I will say, though, though, that because, it, because the um, hit rate is between 30 and 33 percent, where you expect chance of 25 percent, you run up statistical si- significance very quickly that way. It's a significant jump from 25 to 30 some odd percent statistically and it does not take a lot of trials before you start before you get to the point where it's like 
okay, this is just, this is way beyond chance. This is way beyond, um, you know, pos- possible errors and things. It's, um, you know, the, the minimum, the minimum is like one in 20 for science. And, you know, this is getting into billions, to, you know, chances of this occurring by chance or billions to one. Uh, so they're achieving this statistical significance, which is more important than having a lot of studies. Were the studies eventually taken as serious science by the scientists, or did he have to fight for absolutely every type of result he got? Well, when it comes to publishing with the scientific, you know, publishing at large and trying to get acceptance in the scientific community, you have to keep in mind everything in parapsychology is controversial all the time. Everything. Uh, and there are always people trying to sabotage your work. Uh, and the first one, the, the, the first one to attempt this was uh, Richard Weissman. He's a skeptic. He, he's he has a number of incidences where he's gone in there and kind of played with things and, and gotten no results and then published it widely that he couldn't, you know, he, he proved it all wrong. And uh, so he did a meta-analysis of a bunch of studies and, and said that he got no effect and that, you know, this, this shows that the researchers aren't doing their job, yada, yada, yada. And, then they went back. Uh, researchers found all kinds of flaws in there, and one in particular, which was that uh, he was taking um, taking it study by study and not paying attention to the size of the study when he was doing the meta analysis, uh, when he should have uh, done his statistics by trial and just lumped all the trials together. And when you did this, when you did the meta analysis properly, he actually had a significant positive effect, but the damage is done. People were waiving this meta-analysis, which supposedly um, disproved the guns felt all over the place for a few years. Uh, so in 2010, uh, a bunch of uh, parapsychology researchers, including the senior, the, like the guy, Dean Radin, um, published uh, a, a study showing six different meta-analyses of the Gunsfeld and how they were all positive, even when they were done by skeptics. And somebody came along and said, no, 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 you're all wrong, and published a, um, a rebuttal to that, and then they had to rep- publish a rebuttal to the rebuttal. And on it goes. No matter what they do, the skeptics will find a way to, um, to make it appear as though the research... Uh, isn't isn't good when in reality the um, the skeptics are just they're they're, they're playing with the statistics um, you know when they're trying to disprove these things one of the uh, one of the things that they do is to ignore what the researchers actually did and say well we did this differently and now we didn't have we did this differently we got no results uh, which which disproves everything they just did. But the problem is if you if that's how you approach it, that I did it all differently, then you haven't really disproven anything. Um, so I can go into specifics, but it's, it's, it gets really hard to explain exactly what they're up to because it's statistical tricks. I have a question from God of Thunder at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. He is asking, how long is the actual test itself? I actually don't know. Um, You know, in all the literature I've read, nobody's mentioned that, and I haven't been to to go see one. Uh, I, sorry, I, I don't know. My guess is probably about an hour. And the information that they could get from that one hour could take days, if not months, to research every single second of it. Uh, They're only looking, uh, in a replication study, they're only looking for one thing. That is, the receiver uh, is picking one of four photos 
And either they got that right or they got that wrong. It's just there's a lot of lead up to it uh, in order to create conditions that are uh, favorable for psychic ability. If all you did was just stick people in two different rooms and, and say, okay, go, now you pick one of these four, you'd get no results every time. You have to get everybody in the, in the proper space, the proper mood, uh, and just, just all the conditions right to get the best possible results. Um, th- that's, that's, that's what makes this experiment uh, slow and uh, expensive, is getting the conditions right. Some of the criticisms that came across about from scientists that they had concerns about were isolation, randomization, the psi assumption. Do you think any of these criticisms were val- valid from the scientific community as they researched into the Gansfeld experiment? Um, no, not really. I the. Um which which ones did you just give me? Can you can you repeat that? Well, there was some concern. I'll, I'll do them individually. There was some concern okay. that there was isolation being a problem. That the soundproof rooms could actually complicate someone's memory because let's face it, when we're in pure science or silence, you know, our mind can make up any type of sound. Then there was randomization, where the variety of selections that were made were apparently made to choose the first selection they are shown. So they're wondering if that was rigged. So let's talk about the isolation and randomization right off the bat. Well, I mean, they're, they're in electromagnetically soundproofed rooms. Uh, so they've designed a, a room specifically for them, and these people are nowhere near each other when this takes place. So there's no way for them to transfer information to each other any, any way the, except for telepathy, really. That's the only way that they're going to manage that based upon the structure of the setup. You get this person in the soundproof room here, that person in the soundproof room over there. That's it. You know, you, there's no way for, for information in, uh, to transfer any other way. So I don't know why they're coming up with that one. Now, when it comes to the randomization, um, you know... They, they follow ordinary procedures for this. The gun stuff has been done to death for like 30 or 40 years. All this stuff's been worked out. There's no, um, you, you know, th- these are, um, th- these are not valid complaints. They, uh, as I said, they use, first of all, they don't use pseudo randomization. They use uh, scientific grade. Uh, they call them random event generators. So there isn't an algorithm that's screwing everything up. Uh, and, and the other thing is, is that the person at the other end is choosing one out of four photos, and these are also randomized as to which, which order they're going to be in. Um, people are just making this stuff up, really. There aren't, these problems don't exist. What about the psi assumption where it was believed that any statistical deviation from the chance of evidence for telepathy is highly controversial. Uh, well, you know, when you say the psi assumption, it, it, you, it, it, it's either psi or, or, or what? I mean, what else can it be? It, you have this anomaly where people are getting the correct picture better than chance, and they're doing it consistently. So you're saying, well, maybe it's not psychic ability. Okay, fine. What is it? Uh, psychic ability is the only explanation. Um, I, it's it's kind of hard to uh, to say much more about that because it's it's like what it's it's like well, what else are you going to come up with? Okay, the not psi assumption. It's something, but it's not psychic ability. Uh, it's Again, it's it's people picking stuff out of thin air because they don't want to believe. A couple of questions. Uh, they don't want to face. Go, go sure. ahead, please. Uh, no, I'm, I'm done. Okay, a couple of questions from our audience. I jumped the gun there, and I apologize, Craig. 
God of Thunder at hashtag Spaced Out Radio on Twitter is asking, are the test subjects tested multiple times? If so, how far apart? Uh, I believe it's once a day. Uh, maybe twice, but not, not anything more than that. But trying to hit a... Uh, they're, they're doing it at a time of day that they believe they have the best... Um, the best shot at getting a uh, positive result. Uh, if they're doing it multiple, if they're doing the, the same person multiple times, then they'll be doing it on different days. But yeah, they'll test people more than once. They, they want, um, you know, especially if somebody is just showing pot, well, actually, they know beforehand how much they're going to test every single person. Um, but if, um, uh, but that particular process, they're, you know, they're obviously interested in um, getting good results. Mm-hmm. So they, you know, I, I suppose in, you know, future experiments, if they have somebody who's really successful in the first one, they'll bring them in for another one. Um, but they know, they know, they have to have all this stuff set up ahead of time in order to make sure that um, they don't get any flack because they get a tremendous amount of um, blowback from skeptics looking for everything real or imaginary that they can use to disprove these studies. Mm. So they have to be very careful about how they, how they do them. You mentioned that they would pick a certain time of day to do these tests. Was it random for each person to where that person was comfortable during the day, or did they just look at a clock and say, we believe that 10 o'clock at night is the perfect time to do this, or is it like the paranormal where it's believed that between 1 and 4 a.m. is the perfect time because the veil is the thinnest at that point? How did they determine that time? There's something called local sidereal time. Uh, it has nothing to, it's LST. Uh, it has uh, nothing to do... or. It, it doesn't operate on the regular clock. And uh, I think it's, God, if I, I can't remember the number, I think it's uh, 1330 or something, local sidereal time. Uh, psi effect for like an hour or so will jump to four times normal. I have no idea why. But uh, I think it's when the, um, w- when the uh, center of the galaxy is above the horizon or something like that. We, uh, we are only about three and a half minutes away from before we go to break and a quick first hour here on SOR. I want to get into a couple more questions here, if you don't mind. Gail sure. is asking, Craig, have you ever been tested? If so, how did you do? I have not been tested on the Gonsfeld. Um, I've, I've done some online test stuff uh, with mixed results. You know, you do well for a couple minutes, and then, oh, wow, I did really well, and then keep going, and then it sort of uh, dies out. Um, I, but, no, nope, never been tested on the Gunsfeld. It's really rare to be tested. There, we're talking about, like, 4,000 trials worldwide since for in the past 30 or 40 years um, in terms of the replication when there's just not that many people are tested. You have to be in the right place at the right time. And Eric is asking, is the room the same setup as a Faraday cage? Uh, it is kind of like a Faraday cage in that it's um, electromagnetically um, uh, proofed. Uh, so, yeah, I guess it's, it's kind of like a Faraday cage. Yeah. Still some upheaval over that whether or not it works or whether or not it doesn't. All in all, when you look at, and we got about two minutes left here, when you look okay. at the Gansfeld experiment, would you call it a success or would you say that there's still way too much research to be done on it to even give a clear, concise answer? It is an overwhelming success by any sane scientific standard. That's my answer. It is, it is, it's an overwhelming success. It would be completely accepted if it was anything else but psychic ability. It wouldn't even be a question. God of Thunder on Twitter has a very interesting question that we're going to throw in here. If a test subject scores extremely high, what happens to the subject? 
Are they hired by the military or some other black op company? To my knowledge, nothing happens. Um, I've never heard of anybody being selected out of there uh, and, um, and singled out for anything else. Nobody, as far as I know, nobody cares. Uh, it's just another mark in your experimental uh, sheet. And the psychics aren't, you know, it doesn't, nobody gets, you know, rewards or work or anything like that out of it, as far as I know. Very intriguing indeed. Very intriguing. I mean, this is one of those tests that absolutely, you know, no pun intended, blows your mind because nobody knows how they're going to score. You don't know if that picture in your brain is the same as what's on the test. And I'm sure it nope. made, made a lot of people very happy when the results came back positive. I would think so. Yeah, it's a double-blind test. Nobody, no, the researcher doesn't know what picture is coming up. The, the, the person, the sender doesn't know what picture is coming up. The receiver, nobody knows what picture is coming up. It's all done automatically and all done randomly, so there's no way... Uh, there, there's there's no way for anybody to interfere with that. So if you get it right, it's it's remarkable. Greg Weiler's our guest on Spaced Out Radio tonight as we bring in the Gansfeld Experiment. We're going to get more into psychic ability in hour number two, how it leads into the paranormal, right here on the Mighty SOR. Hour number two coming up next. Looking for news beyond the mainstream news? Head to spacedoutradio.com and check out the SOR Spacewire. This is Spaced Out Radio's Eric Markham, News Director for the SOR Spacewire. Daily, I will bring you intriguing stories and outlandish reports from what's going on around the world. UFO sightings, paranormal activity, conspiracies, alternative health, and so much more. And if you have news, email me at news at spacedoutradio.com. Hi there. I'm Butch Witkowski, lead investigator with you 4 cop On the final Monday of every month, you can listen to me and host Dave Scott on Spaced Out Radio's Strange Days. We're going to get to the heart of the matter when it comes to what's happening out there. People are seeing and experiencing things from ET contact to Bigfoot, and I want to hear about it. Your experiences are what we investigators need to help solve these unknown mysteries. So tune in at spacedoutradio.com. Have you had an experience you can't explain? Had a run-in with ghosts, maybe Bigfoot, or seen lights in the sky? Hi, I'm Mike Schmidt from the SOR Sight Lines. I'm here to investigate your sighting. Head to spacedoutradio.com and fill out a report on the sight lines. All your information is 100% confidential, and I will help you figure out what you've been seeing. File your report, and let's find out the answers together. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit, and expect a miracle. Strange creatures lurking in the night, the sounds of wood knocking in the forest, odd happenings right out of a fictional world. These are the reports I love. Hi there, this is author Ronald Murphy, and I would love it if you'd join me and Spaced Out Radio host Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month on our journey into the unknown land of cryptozoology at spacedoutradio.com from Mothman to Frogman and everything in between. Hey, they don't call me the crypto guru for nothing. Are you interested in advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Head to our website at spacedoutradio.com and click on our advertising tab. There, you will find an assortment of ways you can get your product out there with us. From radio commercials to banners and social media, have a product you like our hosts to endorse? We can do that too. Visit spacedoutradio.com for more details. From British Columbia to Northern California, Pacific North Weird has Cascadia covered. Check out our feature videos at spacedoutradio.com where I, 
Vincent Zunza, and my super sleuth partner Alexandra Sullivan track down the weird and strange stories from around the Pacific Northwest, from Bigfoot to Mel's Hole and everything in between. This is what makes life exciting. So why report the normal when we can report the Pacific North Weird? Right here at spacedoutradio.com. Oh, there's only one way to rock. Loud and proud. In high definition. Radio 702 Rocks. Las Vegas. Have you ever had an extraterrestrial experience? One you just couldn't explain? Well, maybe I can help. Hello, I am Samantha Mullet. On the second Tuesday of each month, I will join Dave Scott on Space Out Radio to bring a human aspect to ET contact. It's something I've lived with my entire life, and I'd love to help you understand. Let's share our experiences. The ET experience, the second Tuesday of each month, only on Space Out Radio. Hi there, this is Jolene with Reveal at Reiki and Readings, and I want you to relax. Let me help you chill out and get in touch with your body, mind, and soul. In this busy world, sometimes we need to let go, and this is where I can help. Visit my website, rivuletrnr.wix.com forward slash rivuletrnr. Every Saturday and Sunday night, as Dave Scott wanders aimlessly in the wilderness, you can come hang out with me, James Tyson, and Spaced Out Weekend. Starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, I'll take you along as we talk with some of the best experts in their fields. Spacedoutradio.com is the place to find us. So sit down, relax, put your feet up, enjoy the topics like the paranormal, supernatural, intuitiveness, and so much more. Hope to see you there. Hi there, this is your psychic medium, Joanna, and I would love it if you would join us every other Sunday on Spaced Out Weekend. With host James Tyson, we'll bring you personal psychic messages on two mediums and a large. Questions about love, life, career changes. We would love it if you would come and join us live. Call in and listen in for the experience. Allow us to open the doors to your other side. Two mediums and a large. Heard only on Spaced Out Weekend at spacedoutradio.com. Would you like to become one of our space travelers? All you have to do is click on the space travelers icon at spacedoutradio.com. For only $5 a month, you can get access to some great prizes, as well as private monthly shows, newsletters, and a members-only section on our website. Become a space traveler today. Do you have a topic or a guest that you'd like to hear on Spaced Out Radio? Let us know at spacedoutradio.com where you can sign up to become a Space Traveler member today. Or you can find us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on our Facebook page, Spaced Out Radio Show. Welcome back to Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. We finish off another week with Craig Weiler. Before we bring him back on, I do want to remind you that... I will exit the cabin. I'm going off into the negative temperatures here to find myself a nice warm cave to find my zen, my chi, so I can tune into Space Out Weekend Saturday and Sunday nights with Elizabeth Anglin and James Tyson starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time right here at spacedoutradio.com. Hey, if you want to find us on Twitter, you can do so at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, I can be followed at Dave Scott, S-O-R. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. Tune us in on TuneIn. Download this show and others on iTunes. Our website, which has a plethora of features is spacedoutradio.com. I do want to welcome in everyone listening in on the Revolution Radio chat room and on the network as well. The Double R Machine is a donation station financed by you, the valued listener. Do us a favor, visit freedomslips.com and donate today. And thank you to everyone listening in on the United Public Radio Network, live on 107.7 FM in New Orleans and over 160 countries around the world. Good to have you along for the ride as well. Bill Cardwell has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Telesthesia. Telesthesia is the password for tonight. Make sure you use it wisely because you don't want to give it away too much. Telesthesia is your password. We bring Craig Weiler back in to Space Out Radio. We're going to get to your questions here for Craig before we start talking a little bit about telepathy and psychic ability. Craig, welcome back. Thank you very much, Dave. Let's get to a question from Eric in the Space Out Radio chat room. He is asking, 
When they were doing the tests for the Gansfeld experiments, did they ever do any kind of brain monitoring to see if there was any physiological evidence? Um, they don't do brain monitoring during the Gansfeld itself because that's simply too invasive. You need um, you need a CAT scan uh, or an fMRI for that particular type of thing. Uh, they so. They do have experiments with those machines, but those are different experiments. It's not the Gansfeld. Uh, and, you know, basically they're, they're looking for relaxed state in people. And um, uh, they haven't, you know, there's, they, they haven't found anything where, as far as I know. Uh, it's like this is the psychic part of the brain. They, they haven't done anything like that, uh, but then they really haven't done that. Uh, with much, you know, with, with very many things at all. They're, uh, it's more of a whole brain thing as far as I know. On Twitter at hashtag Space Out Radio, God of Thunder is asking, how does the Gansfield experiment differ from remote viewing? Oh, remote viewing is a completely different process. Uh, so the Gansfield is a very controlled experiment designed to produce experimental results. Uh, the remote viewing is, we're going to put this psychic ability to use, and we're going to find out something useful with it. Uh, so in remote viewing, uh, you'll typically have two people in the room. Uh, nobody is trying to control for an experiment here. So you have one person uh, laying down, uh, and they're the one that, that's going on essentially a guided journey, and then you have another person with them, that is prompting them to, you know, stay with us, don't drift away too far, keep talking to me so that we can get some valuable information from you. Uh, and then the, so, so we have a uh, sitter and we have a talker. The talker will uh, tell the person, um, you know, we're, <clears throat> this is what you need to do. Uh, we have this envelope here with this information in it. The envelope is labeled ABC. So what, tell me uh, what you discover from ABC. And the person laying down, uh, the sitter, will, you know, get themselves into the proper um, frame of mind and then start talking the images out. Uh, it, it's better if they don't know anything at all about where they're, what they're supposed to do because then they can't, get, um, they can't uh, start making stuff up. Uh, and... You know, based upon that, then if you have enough of these uh, people doing the remote viewing, you can take all that information together and, and form um, form a more complete picture from it. So it's much different from the Gonsfeld. Uh, you're they're out, they're out to find information. They're out to get something useful. They're not just they're not you know going for uh, statistically beating chance. That's not the goal. Let's get to a question from Eric Cooper. He is asking, Craig, what is your wildest psychic ability experience? Is it telepathy? Is it telekinesis? Um, I had a, the, the most powerful one I ever had was, um, this was during the time when the uh, BP thing in the, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico was going on. And I suddenly had this image of, Somebody asked me to look into it, uh, but, and I got this enormously powerful image of this huge, uh, basically, funnel of flame going up. And I attributed it to the, the thing, the BP thing going on. Uh, and it was terrible. I had this image of, like, people being terrified and burning and all this kind of stuff. Well, obviously, that didn't happen in the Gulf. Uh, it happened about... Uh, but 15 miles from my home, uh, there was a 24-inch uh, gas line that busted, blew a column of flame 1,000 feet into the air and burned 50 homes and killed several people. Uh, and that was what I thought it was all going off in the Gulf, but uh, nope, it was right nearby. And then once, once that happened, I realized that that was what the psychic impression had been. Horribly powerful, kind of traumatic. Um, but it, the, the, there's been nothing like that. Uh, there were a couple other uh, things, but they don't. They didn't have quite the emotional impact. They just had much more lasting impacts. Is um, the uh, I knew the very second 
uh, when I picked up a phone to make a phone call one time that this was going to lead to me meeting my wife, who I'm still married to uh, for almost 30 years now. And uh, another time when the house that I'm living in went on the market, I knew the very second that happened. Uh, I was literally on a job, and I looked up, and I go, our house is on the market. Um, and so I, I've had flashes like that, but uh, I, don't, I don't do this full time. Heather is asking, Craig, do you have any statistics on if ESP can be family-related? There is some stuff along uh, along those lines. Um, the uh, so th- there's a, there's a there's a connection between having schizophrenics in the family and having psychics in the family. And just so that you know, I have a schizophrenic uncle. Um, the uh, they're not the same people. Uh, schizophrenics are generally not considered psychic, but there's there's something in there where psychic people tend to show up in the same family. Uh, and then there are, uh, of course, you know, families with psychics in them that will routinely have uh, psychics. How much of this is nature and how much of this is nurture? I can't really say 100% uh, because there's, it's, it's difficult to tease that information out. You know, it's, 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 it's one of those things that even in regular topics, it's not always clear. Um, but, you know, it's psychic ability can be, can be taught. It can be learned. Some people are better at it than others. Uh, you, if you're a highly sensitive person, in other words, your senses are just always uh, high, then chances are you're going to have more psychic ability, um, stuff like that. Ron is asking in the SOR Space Travelers Club, does trauma bring on psychic ability? I have heard of that happening, uh, but I don't have any hard hard information on it. It's all anecdotal. Uh, but, yeah, I, uh, especially in childhood, that uh, uh, if, a, if a child experiences a lot of trauma, they can resort to their psychic ability uh, and amp it up in order to deal with the trauma. Uh, so I've, I don't think there are a lot of studies on that, but uh, that that's something that I'm aware of that shows up occasionally in the literature. Uh, and also, um, there have been, like I was mentioning earlier, autistic children, a couple of them have been tested. Of course, autistic children have a tremendous um, difficulty in communicating but they are also intelligent, very intelligent little people. And these kids uh, can respond, uh, so some of them can respond with amazing telepathy uh, in order to communicate to the point where they're literally, um, they're literally picking out information as accurately as you could possibly hope for. I've seen some of the experiments. They're, they're really incredible. Do you believe there is telepathic communication going on? Uh, yeah, it's all the time. Um, there, uh, the psychologist uh, Jim Carpenter has a book out, uh, which he calls First Sight. And this, this theory, I think, works better than uh, most anything else I've heard. I mean, it just makes sense to me. He says that, uh, that psychic ability is on all the time and that that this is a background thing for us, and it's uh, we only notice it when it pops up in certain situations. The uh, the typical uh, thing is if our if our ordinary senses can handle something, that's what we'll go to. Our ordinary senses will be our go-to method for dealing with the problem. When we when we have a situation with a great deal of ambiguity, ambiguity, then this is a spot where psychic ability might kick in. It's more likely to for some people than for others. Uh, so, for example, personality types that cannot handle ambiguity, uh, you know, authoritarian, uh, skeptical, um, you know, logical, linear types that, that have 
that deal with things in black and white and can't deal with ambiguity but have uh, very little psychic ability. Uh, so you have this going on in the background, and then um, part of what makes what determines whether psychic ability comes out is whether you'll want it to. Uh, and, you know, one of the things in there is, for example, that tests with outgoing people, um, they, they, those outgoing people tend to fare much better if they are shown their results and everybody else has shown their results because they get the attention and that's what they want. And introverted people, it's exactly the opposite. They don't want, they don't want everybody to see their results. They don't want, they don't want everybody to know what they're doing. And if, if, if that's the way it goes, that, that they hide those results from everybody, then they do well. Uh, so there's a personality thing and it's all operating from the subconscious. So being a subconscious ability, it's, uh, it's a little bit harder to, to nail it down. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Well, a lot of people believe that you can have telepathic ability and conversation with animals, with spirits, with divine beings, with cryptid beings. Do you believe this is at all possible to be able to communicate with pretty much anything that has a lifespan, whether it's a tree or a flower or your own personal pet? Yeah, I don't see why not. Makes sense to me. The clarity of the information that you can transfer is going to depend on your individual ability. Um, but you know, the uh, I think more than more than likely, most people will respond emotion to emotion tele- uh, and, and convey emotion telepathically. In fact, I think that's uh, you know a lot of psychic ability is geared towards emotion uh, because it's it's the best way to use that sense. Uh, so you're more likely to pick up emotion uh, than anything else. And uh, also uh, another interesting part of it, uh, this is really my own thing is need. If you don't have a need, it's less likely to, to show up. And if you do have a need, there's a very strong impetus for psychic ability to show up. Uh, this was shown in some, uh, William Bankston did some healing studies on mice um, where the mice were uh, deliberately bred to have no immunity to a particular breast cancer. And so if they were given this breast cancer, they die in 28 days, guaranteed die. And so they did psychic healing on them and something like 99% or maybe it was hundred percent all got cured. All of them. Um, uh, something that should not have happened. Um, uh, and, and this is a need based thing. The mice needed to be healed or they were going to die. So they got healed. Um, so, so the, the ability was very powerful. And for example, the autistic kid needed to communicate. So his telepathy was, was very powerful. Uh, so you're looking at need as being one of these, these parts of it. And, so you could possibly communicate with these pets, but you would, if there's no need, the pets might not be interested in, and you might not be able to get much out of it. But as far as being able to communicate with all these, you know, different um, beings, you know, anything with consciousness, yeah, I don't see why not. Um, you might not get a lot of feedback, but I, I think it can probably be done. A lot of people have tried communicating, especially with spirits using telepathy. Do you believe this is a great paranormal tool that is probably very misunderstood? Um, well, it, it depends. Misunderstood by whom? Um, you know, most people, I think we're talking mediumship here, right? Yes, to an extent. Okay. To an extent. But there's okay. a lot. Of, there's um, a lot of people who don't believe that they have any sort of mediumship, who do hear some sort of telepathic communication at times. It may be faint, but they swear it to the on a Bible or their children's lives that they're hearing it. Um. Well, this first of all, this can be valid, and I don't. You know, I would never say that it wasn't. You you need to know the person and the circumstances. Uh, certainly. You, 
you just you, you need more information than than just I'm hearing the voices. Like if, if everything else about the person is normal, then yeah, this is probably an entity or something uh, going for contact, and they're picking up on it. Uh, the um, I mean, this this sort of thing is possible. There's no there's no reason to automatically deny it or discount it. Uh, you need to stay open to these things. Uh, the question is, uh, of what value is it? Is, is this communication helping anybody in any way? Or is it just somebody trying to get through that has an emotional, emotional problem and the best thing you can do is get rid of them? I mean, you just, you need more information. So when it comes to telepathy, again, how does it work for people? Because there is a lot of people who will say, how do I know that's not my imagination? That's exactly what my dog is trying to tell me or what my friend in California is trying to tell me. Um, well, basically, the one of the problems of all psychic ability is you have no idea where it's coming from, ever. This is, this is, this is, this, this is something that researchers have talked about. Are, is it coming, is the psychic ability originating from me? Is it being sent to me? Am I picking it, you know, am I picking something out of the air from the Akashic records or something? No idea. No idea. It's, it's because it all originates in the mind and the mind feels all like one thing. So there's no idea, there's no way of knowing whether it's being sent or not, uh, sent or, for that matter, from the future. There's really... But from the past, it, there, there's just no way to know exactly what that is. So if you want to know whether something is real or not, you have to look for information that um, from ordinary reality that confirms it. Unless you can get that information, you really have no way to confirm it. Um, and from that point, there are it's it's simply a matter of experience. That's why, um, you know, generally, I, I don't know, it, this might not work for everybody, but usually older people do better with sorting all this stuff out than younger people just because of the experience and saying, oh, okay, I know what this is. That's psychic. I'm actually picking this up from somebody because I have X amount of experience from this, and I know that that's what that is. Um, but other than that, there's no, like, easy way to, to say it because it's, psychic ability is just freaking mysterious. So with telepathy, have you ever tested it out with, say, your wife or your best friend just to see if you could pick up what each other is saying mentally? Um, well, like most people have been married for a long time, I will notice occasionally that we're sharing a thought because I'll think of something and she'll start talking uh, and vice versa. This, thing, this just happens between married people. I mean, it's just uh, my wife and I are very close. Uh, and that kind of thing happens. With regards to pets, um, I can call them in the house occasionally if I need to, uh, and it's important. I can't do if I try to do it all the time; they'll ignore me. But um, I can occasionally, wherever they are, say, you know, kind of send them a mental image. Can you come in now? It's time, and they'll they'll you know about two or three minutes later they'll wander up to the door. Uh, so that's my experience. That is very interesting indeed. So what about with pets? Have you ever tried it out with, I don't know if you have pets or not. I have 11 cats. Oh my goodness. <laughs> how, do you, how do you do uh, 11 cats? I can barely do one. Um, well, most of, everything is done in groups. Uh, so if you have to go to the vet, you, know, you never take just one cat to the vet. You take three. We, we, we did rescues for several years, so we have several Turkish vans uh, running around. It's a particular type of white cat. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I don't really think too much about the telepathy. I don't, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a need-based thing. If I need it, I will work on it. And um, mostly it's like, is this cat okay or is this cat not okay? Does it need to go to the vet or not or whatever? Um, then I'll check psychically. Uh, but I don't really try to carry on a conversation with them. What's a conversation with a cat like? 
I don't know. I don't try. It seems kind of pointless. It's like cats are uh, ca- cats are just pissed off because you're looking at the be- the best of times. <laughs> um. Well, uh, mine are pretty engaged. Uh, the 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 thing about cats is that they um they have their own minds. They're not like totally dialed in on you. They have their own life and their own world that they, that they think is important. It's not necessarily what you think is important. Um, that's just how cats are. Uh, and so if what you're doing doesn't seem important to them, they'll ignore you. I could go on for hours. <laughs> oh, cats are egotistical, my friend. They are totally egotistical. Oh, yes. I would agree. You know, I know there's cat lovers out there. Shar, one of our regular listeners, you know, her cat is, is you know, one of the good ones, I'm assuming. And I had a good one once, you know, a few years ago. But for the most part, they're just angry little beasts. Angry little beasts that hate everything. And I could go on like that for hours, my friend. <laughs> Eleven cats! How do you do it? How do you do it? Uh, you don't leave any glasses on the counter, do you? Uh... I don't leave any ca- I don't leave any glasses near the edge. That's for sure. Nothing that can break ever gets near the edge of any counter. Because they'll they'll just they'll go ahead. They'll, they'll be like a cat magnet. They'll just come right over and knock that sucker down. No. Um, I look. Okay, well, first of all, there's there's my wife and I, and um, we have a couple of renters. Everybody sort of chips in a little bit and gives the cats enough attention. Uh, for the most part, they're they're pretty calm. We Oops. make it work. It sounds like you lucked out on that part. Let's switch over to psychic ability here for a couple of minutes because I don't know if you've ever used your abilities in a paranormal situation, but there's a big debate going on in the paranormal field with a lot of these investigative teams on whether or not a psychic should be a part of any paranormal investigation. It's funny, they'll rely on any type of equipment or gear that they buy, and it could range from 50 bucks up to $10,000 in equipment. But when it comes to a psychic, no, nope, we can't trust that person. We don't want them flying the evidence. What is your opinion on that? Um, I, I would say that depends tremendously on the psychic themselves. It's, uh, it's very difficult for, uh, for anybody to know whether the psychic is getting what they call veridical information, which is stuff that can be verified. Um, you know, or you can't tell whether the psychic is, is getting something real or whether they've picked up, uh, they picked up something that's like, you know, in their conscious mind and they're just sort of running with it and thinking that they're doing it while they're actually not, uh, there's no way to know. And I have heard anecdotally that psychics can actually, you know, if you're chasing a ghost, the psychics can actually end up, uh, shooing them away. Uh, you know, ruining the effect. So I, I have, I can understand why this is uh, a difficult area for the paranormal community. Uh, if, uh, if I was in a, in a team, I would work very hard to find the right psychic, um, to find somebody who just who could take a step back and who wouldn't, uh, in, you know, who who would be very cautious about offering too much information. Uh, and would be very, um, very sure about being, uh, you know, noting the ambiguity in what they were getting. But, you know, you just want somebody who's really, really truthful with themselves in a situation like that. Otherwise, it's going to be hard for the team. Um, some psychics can fall into a, a, you know, an egotistical position, and you can't. You can't have anybody on a team that's super egotistical, no matter what position they are, um, and psychics included. I don't know what else I can add to that. Uh, I've never been on one of these teams, um, and I've I I don't know psychics who have. And and you know what I've seen on TV was pure garbage, so I have I, I can't really rely on that. 
The other debate, and I want this, and the reason why I'm asking you this is because you have a very unbiased point of view, Craig, when it comes to Mm -hmm. psychic ability. On a paranormal investigation, one of the other big debates regarding psychics and mediums are people who want to look into a place of investigation thoroughly before they go in because they feel it heightens their ability to communicate with the other side and then there are those who say no you're you're like a ghost box or you're like a camcorder you're a tool of for capturing evidence we don't want you knowing a thing about where we are investigating you tell us which way would you side with that uh the less the psychic knows the better information they're likely to get the less they know. I mean, that's just that, that they've, um, they've discovered this through remote viewing sessions was that the less the, the remote viewers got, the better they did. Um, so you start this person off with zero real information. Uh, you get, you, they need something to tie it to. So maybe you take the information, you put it in an envelope and you put some nonsense, uh, uh, code on the top to reference it and that's it that's all they get is this nonsense code and from there they have to they have to take it from there the less information the less ex, the less expectations they'll have and the more likely they are to produce good information if they do produce any getting out of the par- really getting out of the paranormal here for a second and just looking mm-hmm. at psychic ability, there's a lot of people who also believe that everyone is psychic. However, most of us lose it due to wrong influence from our parents and family, teachers, school kids, uh, any type of outside influence. Do you believe that everybody is born psychic? Um, I think... Well, I, I, I'm um, in favor of the uh, view uh, from Jim Carpenter in his book, First Sight, that it's, it's an underlying element of reality is, is psychic ability, which gets back into quantum physics and entanglement and all that kind of thing, um, where, you know, we're basically all one entity. Uh, the... Uh, the, the thing is that the, the psychic ability is going to show up um, based a, in part on personality uh, and, and just how a person is wired as well as their environment. Because um, you can have, there are, of course, people who have come from incredibly skeptical environments that turned out to be psychic and other people coming from really psychic environments who turned into total skeptics, they completely flipped it. Um, and it, it you know, it would seem to defy uh, reason, but there you have it. These things happen. Uh, so uh, are we born psychic? Yeah, that, because everything, you know, there, there's an argu- there, there's a theory that psychic ability is, is um, guiding our senses all the time that that's part of uh part of experiencing reality is psychic ability we're just not aware of it until it pops up and looks abnormal uh that's the theory that that i go with do you think children are more psychic than what we as adults lead them on to be um i think uh some are not all of them uh some kids just just don't don't have it uh you're more likely to see a clear uh when when kids do uh exhibit psychic ability uh there it's usually a very clean version because you know the kids don't have any prior expectations they don't judge the information that's coming through because they have no reference point for it uh so they're just when the information comes through, it just flows through them, and it's very obvious that they're not um, that they're not, they're not imposing something on it. So it's very easy to differentiate what they're doing from from somebody else. In other words, with a child, you can say this is not an act because they're not capable of doing an act. So you know that the information that they're getting is real, uh, but uh, they also uh, 
lack judgment about psychic ability. So they, and, and the ability to really direct it, you know, turn it on, turn it on to something specific that they, uh, that they don't, um, that they might not know about. Uh, so, you know, it's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, they can do this channel, this, uh, fairly, uh, good information. On the other hand, they, they're not really great at directing it because they don't have the experience or the adult capacity to do that. So if somebody comes up to you and says, I think I'm psychic, I need to work with this. I'm starting to have what I feel are premonitions or a lot of deja vu. What do you tell a person who has absolutely no clue but feels they need to learn whether or not they are? Um, well, the best thing to do if you're just starting out is, you know, if you've got a, a class taught by a psychic, there's usually, you know, everybody's got one in their community where there's, you know, either it's a group or they've got a psychic teaching classes in psychic ability. Take a class, learn from them, see what you can find out. Um, see if something lights up for you. Uh, and, you know, just go down that rabbit hole in a little ways and see what you can, see what you can find out. Either it's going to, either it's going to catch, catch on for you or it's not. Uh, and you know, you need to discover that for yourself, push, push a little bit, find out what, you know, what you can do. Uh, that's what I did. It, 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 uh, it helped me establish that that was something that I was interested in was I took a class. What about the fakers out there, though? And what I mean by that is, I'm going to draw a newer comparison to the Sasquatch hunters on television, where a lot of the pure researchers who have been doing it for decades believe that these television shows have absolutely ruined the credibility of decades of research. In the 90s, when the 1900 numbers started becoming popular, there was a big influx in psychic 1-900 numbers where you could call, get a reading, or, or a card reading, or tea leave reading, or whatever kind of reading you wanted at only five ninety nine a minute. But there were people <laughs> literally spending thousands upon thousands of dollars. And in the end, people were getting rich off of people's mis- misery, or their depression, or their anxiety... What do you think of all that? Um, in any industry, you're going to have crooks. And if people can be exploited, they're going to be. Um, now, this is going to be in an unregulated industry uh, like psychics and mediums. There are going to be ripoffs. And if somebody can scale it and rip off a whole bunch of people for a whole lot of money, uh, they'll do it. And, the, you know, it's... Uh, there's nothing really anybody can do to stop it short of regulating the industry, uh, which, you know, it's, it's, nobody's really doing that. Um, it's basically buyer beware. Uh, I, I'm in construction myself. It's a highly regulated industry because people have been ripped off for thousands of dollars in this industry. Uh, and really it's the same thing. If, if, you know, if there's money to be made, there will be crooks, especially if the money can be made without going to jail. Um, and that's certainly going to hold in, in something involving psychics because there's no way to prove that they've, um, you know, short of uh, actually defrauding somebody, uh, and, you know, like with the, the, these curse things, you know, I can stop this curse from happening, but you need to pay me $12,000, et cetera, where that's, that's clearly fraud. Uh, but if you're, if you're thinking, you know, if you're giving people sort of, sort of fake readings for you know twenty dollars here, thirty dollars there, or something, there's nothing anybody can do about it. And that's free beer, no cops for the uh, for the criminals. Uh, it's buyer beware. There's no you know it's unless somebody regulates the industry, there's there's no protection. That's just how it is. I got a question from Bill Cardwell in the SOR Space Travelers Club. He is asking, if psychic ability is real, 
Why are the biggest winners of lotteries and at casinos not those with these abilities who go entirely on premonition? Um, well, the uh, first of all, you know, I, a psychic, I, I don't know if you, I, I've been in casinos myself. I can't stand them. It's a really, really horrible energy in casinos. Um, and as far as lotteries go, um, there's a reason people have trouble picking out numbers in a lottery is it goes against the basics of um, human perception. And that uh, in, in all of our human perceptions, the way we're built, the way we're designed is to notice differences. So if we have a light in a room, we cannot tell you what the absolute brightness of that light is. We can't tell you how many lumens just by looking at it. But we can tell you whether it's brighter than another light or not because we notice the contrast, um, which is why a human can pick out a little black dot on a white piece of paper when it's really, really minuscule. Um, but they would have a very hard time picking out a slightly uh, – uh, they're very – hard time telling you how black something is. So the, you're looking at differences. And when you're talking about something like um, uh, numbers, numbers all psychically are kind of like the same thing. So you're going to have a hard time picking out differences between them because they're all very much the same. Um, because that's, that's just how human perception works. I've heard of people doing well in, uh, psychically in gambling, uh, and there is a bookie that I know of that I've spoken to personally who uses psychics to uh, beat the odds by an extra 10% or so. Uh, it can be done, uh, but they're not going to tell anybody. And they're sure as hell not going to tell casinos. Uh, those people are operate on the down low. They're not going to share what they're doing because that's how they make their money. Well, it still doesn't make the fact that if you go down to the local 7-Eleven and buy a lottery ticket, whether mm-hmm. it's for the Powerball or up here the Lotto Max, we never hear of a psychic winning. Well, there are, there are some occasions of psychics winning these things, um, but uh, it's, it's really hard to pick out numbers because uh, you're dealing with the inability of human perception, and this include, includes psychic ability, of picking out the differences in the numbers. That's just, it's not the way psychic ability was designed. It's, it's not what it does best. Um, numbers look very similar to one another, and so you're going to have a hard time picking them apart uh, psychically. It's not going to be obvious or easy. You can you might be able to psychically tell or something whether something was green or red or whether somebody was old or young where you have really high contrasts. Uh, psychic ability has also been shown to be, uh, to be better when there's, some, when there's action involved. Uh, so if you have a picture of a rocket taking off, this will be easier to see psychically than an apple. Um, so you have these very non-energetic, very, very similar numbers. Uh, that is one of the, uh, um, that, that is one of the areas where psychic ability is just not all that great. So when you look at everything as a whole concept in regards to psychic ability, what is something that is very, very keen that people can eye on if they are unsure of whether or not they are psychic? Because a lot of people don't have time for a course or, or to take any testing. They just know what's going on inside of them. Uh, well, there's, there's a couple things. One of them, um, this is an experiment done by Rupert Sheldrake on staring, uh, is that you can get somebody to notice you by staring at their back. Uh, and I, I've literally, I, I, I was at a restaurant one time and I did this for a friend. Um, was like, I needed to get, a, to, I needed to have a waiter uh, come to our table. So I stared at the back of his head and I kind of gave him that thing. And you saw his shoulders kind of jump. Then he turned and came straight to the table. Uh, 
kind of freaked my friend out a little bit there uh, because it was such an it, it, it worked so obviously. So staring is one of the ways that that you can you can use psychic ability. The other one is to uh, you should be able to pick up on people's emotions pretty easy. That's one of the easier psychic things to do. Is uh, is most people uh, can do empathy uh, a little bit more easily than than like picking out a you know a I am thinking of a rocket in in space or something. That's harder to pick out than you're angry, you're sad, you know that kind of thing. Those are easier because they're emotions. All right, I'm going to uh, t- tell you something that just happened here 30 seconds ago. Eric Markham, mm-hmm. who is coming on the show for hour number three with me, he just messaged me on Facebook. And I got a call in, and I was just about while you were talking, thinking, oh, shoot, I have to ask him for his phone number again to get him to type in the phone number he wants me to call. And as soon as Mm -hmm. I turned my head to the computer, he had typed out his phone number. Yeah, that's um, synchronicity. Yeah, that's that's part of psychic ability, too. Uh, I know the skeptics argue that this is all chance, yada, 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 but, um, you know, we you guys are of the same mind at the same moment. You're, you know, you're thinking of him, he's thinking of you. And, uh, you know, that this, this sort of thing can happen. It's a mm-hmm. synchronous, um, you know, the lining up of the thoughts, it's just hard to control it. Uh, and when you're, when you're trying to develop your psychic ability, you need, uh, you, you need, uh, situations that you can definitely say, yeah, I intended to do this. And this is the result I got. And that's where you need to hit the really easy stuff. Question from Ron coming in, and he is asking, can you explain the difference between a psychic and intuition? Um, uh, intuitive is sort of psychic light. Uh, and psychic is, is getting more deeply into it. So, you know, for example, as a psychic, you're, you're going to get yourself into a frame of mind where you're going, where you're trying to be receptive uh, to this information. Um, whereas intuitive, you're just kind of picking up general impressions and going with that. Uh, maybe something psychic will turn up from it, but if it doesn't, nah. Uh, so there's there's lower expectations with intuition. That's that's as near as I can pick out with it. That's my impression. Moving on in regards, what's the difference then between someone who is psychic and someone who has empathy or is an empath, empathetic feelings? Empathy is one of the um, is is one of the indicators that psychic ability might be present. Um, when people are highly sensitive and uh, and empathetic, uh, then they're then they're tuned, you know that they're tuned to other people and they're more likely to get psychic impressions about them if they, if they care and if they focus on it. Um, so, you know, empathy is one of the indicators. It's, uh, but it's, it's not psychic ability itself. The, um, psychic ability is, is like picking, um, uh, you're picking stuff out of the noise and, your ability to do something psychically is 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 partly due to your ability to recognize when you're picking something out, out of the noise and also to quiet the noise down um, but empathy empathy really isn't about that you're just you're just seeing somebody and then um, and then feeling for them you're having strong feelings about uh, somebody else's uh, life and it, it's not psychic ability itself, but it is an indicator of somebody who has uh, where psychic psychic ability might be, you know, might be there. There's a lot of people who get different reactions to the messages that are coming through. Some people are clairaudient, some people are clairvoyant, clairsentient, clarinet, if they play music. You know, there's a lot of people who have the different abilities. How come one can have, say, a clairaudient 
sound, and others are clairsentient or clairvoyant? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I, I don't have a definitive answer for that. Uh, that, that question hasn't come up in literature that I've read. Uh, or if it has, it's a stated question that, that nobody's come up with any sort of definitive answer for it. Uh, the best I can come up with that is that people are different. Uh, it could, uh, very well be that we have, um, we just have some areas where, where our focus is better uh, than others. Or, you know, maybe, maybe for somebody with their hearing, they're able to tune out ex- uh, things that are extraneous with their hearing better than they can with their sight. Um, and other people, it might be that they can tune out, th- tune out extraneous information with their sight better than they can with their hearing. Uh, it's, uh, it's just one of those things. Uh, people are different. Do you find that if you split the sexes, that more women are clairvoyant, whereas more men are clairaudient? Is there any type of rationale between why one would be one way and one would be the other way? I know of no study that's picked out um, that if that particular information uh, as to you know whether men are more this way, women are more that way. Uh, it's just that most, about two, I think about two thirds of psychics are women to start with. Um, uh, I've, I've anecdotally, I've heard more from men uh, than from women about being electromagnetically sensitive, uh, but that's about it. Uh, I've gotten more guys saying you know, I, electromagnetic stuff bothers me than from women. They don't, I don't seem to hear that response from them. Uh, that's, that's about the only thing I can pick out. That surprises me. Do you think a lot of men, because it's the macho thing to be rough, tough, grumble, grow a nice big beard, you know, do you think a lot of men are sensitive to this, but, you know, we just have to play that man card so often that we tune out what's really what we are experiencing? Um, I, I, I really don't know. I, that, that could very well be part of it. Um, men and women focus differently. To, uh, so, you know, you'll see, you see a lot of um, men, big time psychic, big time psychics being men in, um, out of proportion to the proportion of psychics in general. In other words, uh, you, you have guys rise to the top more often. Um, the, the the focus style is different. The um, the what guys will tend to focus on is different. Um, and men do have a harder time than women in terms of developing their ability because, you know, for a guy, one of the things that comes along with psychic ability is, is a high sensitivity. You, you don't get to choose to just be sensitive to psychic ability. You, you're sensitive to every goddamn thing. Um, and, you know, this does not... Being highly sensitive, emotional, highly empathetic, and all these things are, are not manly traits for manly men who do manly things. Excuse me. Um, and, Resume yeah, that, that plays... Thank you. Uh, and, yeah, that, that's going to have an effect on it. I know... Um, I, I personally tend to keep my psychic ability a bit, at a bit of a distance uh, because that doesn't, um, you know, it's not useful uh, in my everyday life. It, it's, uh, it doesn't do to, it doesn't do me any good to be overly sensitive to hammers and saws and noise and whatnot. Uh, although that's what earplugs are for, but uh, you know, it's, you just you don't have the opportunities to develop that softer side when you're a guy. How much of this is uh, uh, actually prevents guys from being psychic? I don't know. That, that's my end answer on that one. It's uh, I just not a problem. Don't know. We we only have about three minutes left with you tonight, Craig. And wow, this show okay. has, has burned on quick. 
when you have someone who starts developing their psychic ability, how important is it for them to learn how to ground themselves so that way maybe if they develop mediumship that they're not being attacked by spirits left, right, and center or anything that's demonic or dark that may want to communicate or try and take over? Oh, I do get that question a lot. Um, the uh, My answer for that is a little bit different in that uh, in order to not be attracting dark, it really helps if you're not dark yourself. Uh, so the the idea is to develop a, a, a light personality, and that will be protective from these things. In my own case, I am an extremely honest, uh, decent person. This is something that I that that's innate for me, but that I also work at it, and uh, that you know I I wish the best for people and I look out for them and all that kind of thing and. The upshot of this is that it's protective against that kind of energy that uh, I recognize darkness, but you also have to stand up to these things. Um, if you if you back away from the darkness in real life, you will attract it in the um, on the psychic side. Uh, so you know you have to toughen up a little bit as a person, be willing to you know uh, be uh, be be good to good and tough at the same time. Be somebody whose toughness is for good. Uh, that's a... Oh, are we on that music note, now? Yeah, on that note, we got to wrap it up, Craig. Thank you so much okay. for being on Spaced Out Radio tonight and filling us in on the Gansfeld Experiment. We really do appreciate it. My pleasure. It's been great. All right, my friend. Thank you so much, and we'll talk to you very soon. All right, thank you. Okay. Bye bye. The SOR Sightlines is Thanks, a place for you to find answers to your strange experiences. Hi there, this is Mike Schmidt. If you have had an encounter with ghosts, UFOs, Bigfoot, ETs, or anything else that doesn't make sense, head to spacedoutradio.com and file a Sightlines report. All information you give is 100% confidential, and I will personally help you find the answers you need. SOR Sightlines, your answers are a click away. Greetings and salutations, space travelers, from the Chronicles of the Unknown team. What is Chronicles of the Unknown? I keep hearing about this thing. It's a new paranormal reality TV show based right here in beautiful British Columbia, Canada. Follow our team as we uncover claims of activity on the Caribou Gold Rush Trail. You can also follow us here every third Monday where two members of our team will be available to answer your questions. We'll give you some equipment updates and some of our experiences on the road, right here on Spaced Out Radio. Hi there, I'm Butch Witkowski, lead investigator with Euphoricop. On the final Monday of every month, you can listen to me and host Dave Scott on Spaced Out Radio's Strange Days. We're going to get to the heart of the matter when it comes to what's happening out there. People are seeing and experiencing things from ET contact to Bigfoot, and I want to hear about it. Your experiences are what we investigators need to help solve these unknown mysteries. So tune in at spacedoutradio.com to the final Monday of every month from Butch Wachowski's Strange Days. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit. And expect a miracle. This is your medium, Joanna, from Spaced Out Weekend, Two Mediums and a Large. I would love it if you would come and join us with host James Tyson every other Sunday on Spaced Out Weekend. Together, we will take your calls and your questions live. Our goal is to provide you with a positive outlook on deep questions that you may have. Questions regarding love, relationships, money, or whatever else is on your mind. Come and check us out at spacedoutradio.com. 
Have you checked out the SOR Space Wire at spaceoutradio.com yet? Every day we post the latest stories regarding the weird, strange, and completely unbelievable. From cryptid and UFO sightings to the conspiracy world, we tackle it all. Hi there, I'm Eric Markham, Space Out Radio's news director for the SOR Space Wire. And if you have a story, I want to hear it. Email me at news at spaceoutradio.com. Patrolling the Pacific Northwest, we are always on the lookout for the strange and unassuming stories that real people are experiencing. Hi, I'm Vincent Zunza from Pacific North Weird. Me and Alexandra Sullivan have teamed to bring to you those odd stories that never seem to make it into the mainstream. Stories so weird that we'll leave you scratching your head wondering, is this real? It's as real as it gets with Pacific North Weird. You can watch our videos right here at spacedoutradio.com. Become more intimate and interactive with Spaced Out Radio. Join our Space Travelers Club with your new membership. For $5 a month, we'll provide you with special access to the website, monthly prize draws from books to psychic readings, along with monthly newsletter, private interviews, and more. Sign up today to be part of Spaced Out Radio's experience. Every month on Spaced Out Radio, we look into the deep and dark reports of cryptids roaming around the world with me, Rob Morphy, from Cryptopia.us. I would love it if you would join me and host Dave Scott as we delve into the most arcane stories and reports regarding creatures of the unknown. My job is to hunt down the details and bring the evidence forward to you. These aren't your regular Bigfoot stories I'm talking about either. You can find out more about crypto history at SpacedOutRadio.com. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Strange creatures lurking in the night, the sounds of wood knocking in the forest, odd happenings right out of a fictional world. These are the reports I love. Hi there, this is author Ronald Murphy, and I would love it if you join me and Spaced Out Radio host Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month on our journey into the unknown land of cryptozoology at spacedoutradio.com. From Mothman to Frogman and everything in between, hey, they don't call me the crypto guru for nothing. Did you know that Spaced Out Radio runs seven days a week? Hi, it's James Tyson from Spaced Out Weekend. Every Saturday and Sunday night, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, you can join me and my guests for some great chatter about what's going on out in the universe or even in that dark part of the basement you really don't want to go back into. Well, let's find the answers to your experiences together. So come on up to Uncle Jimbo's cabin on the weekend. For more information, look us up at spacedoutradio.com. Would you like to connect with us on Spaced Out Radio? Head to spacedoutradio.com to check out the latest shows, guests, and sponsors. And don't forget to sign up for the Space Travelers Club. You'll find all you need at spacedoutradio.com. Welcome back to the final hour of Space Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Good to have you with us as we continue on with hour number three on Paranormal Chatter here on the Mighty SOR. Remember, if you're listening in on Revolution Radio, it is a donation station financed by you, the valued listener. Do us a favor. Go over to freedomslips.com and donate today. Thank you so much if you're listening in on the United Public Radio Network live on 107.7 FM in New Orleans and over 160 countries around the world. Good to have you along for the ride as well. Bill Cardwell has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. It is telesthesia. Telesthesia. 
is your password. Don't know what it means, but it's one of those ones that sounds very good when it rolls off the tongue, so we're going to use it tonight. Telesthesia is your password. If you're an SOR space traveler, make sure you use it wisely. If you want to follow me on social media, you can do so at Spaced Out Radio on Twitter. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, I can be followed at Dave Scott SOR. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. Tune us in on down, on TuneIn. Download this show and others on iTunes and our website is spacedoutradio.com. We bring in the three E's tonight, Eric Cooper, Eric Markham, and Everett Themer. They are my tandem when we got to go into a third hour with a little bit of a different role in the chat. Gentlemen, how are you? Good, how are you? It's very good. And you know what? Tonight, Eric Cooper, we're going to start with you. We were talking about psychic ability with Craig Weiler. And I really liked him. And the reason why I liked what he was saying, and I try and like all of our guests... But I really like how he was able to separate the psychic ability from what we normally utilize it as in our realm as part of the paranormal. What did you think of that? Oh, totally, totally. Because, I mean, you got parapsychology, which is kind of uh, the realm he he focuses on, which is telekinesis, telepathy, that kind of thing. Whereas us in the paranormal use psychics in the sense of vision, of... uh, communication with spirit, uh, which is different than what telepathy and telekinesis and, and whatnot is. Now, on, on that note, I think everyone has an inherent ability. Um, uh, and and I, we were discussing that in the chat, and that anyone, if they focus and if they meditate, can can adapt telepathy. And, and I go with that because of the fact that most abductees um, talk about telepathy with aliens and whatnot, and that tells you right there the channel is open. You start to figure how to how to access it. But yeah, there, I like how he did. He did differentiate between uh, the parapsychology aspect and the uh, the normal uh, psychic aspect. Everett, what is your thoughts on that? I thought he was a great guest. I agree with a lot of what he said. But, you know, as a scientist, he should be a little bit op- more open-minded, I think, and not uh, spend so much effort putting down psychic or not psychics, I'm sorry, skeptics. He seemed to be on a real kick about, uh, you know, not differentiating between a denier and a skeptic and just seemed to want to bash any skeptic opinion that he could. Well, you know what? I think skepticism is healthy. Eric Markham, but there has to be a reliance on proof. And you made a very smart comment in the Space Out Radio chat room during the show where you said real skeptics will change their mind, so to speak, if they are shown proof or proved that their theory of skepticism is denied, if we could put it that way, on whatever the topic may be. Let's say Sasquatch has proven real. There's a lot of skeptics out there who are going to be saying, well, I was wrong on that one. Right. I mean, yeah, a skeptic is somebody who is willing to come to your side, so to speak, if the evidence is there. But the, what the guest was calling a skeptic is what I call a denier. They're the kind of person that if Bigfoot walked out of the woods, slapped him upside the head and walked out, they still wouldn't believe it. You know, the, <clears throat> but an actual skeptic will look at the subject, look at the data, or experience something within the subject that in their mind it's like, well, okay, well, that's beyond a doubt. So, you know. You don't accept everything at face value if you're a skeptic, but the, you don't deny it forever and ever, to, despite the evidence either. Coop, as someone who runs Forest Moon Paranormal down in Concrete, Washington, you deal with a lot of psychics and remote viewers. In your opinion, what is the difference between the two? Okay, remote viewers... Um 
from the CIA perspective of what a remote viewer is, do not interact. They only observe. Um, and they utilize a trainer or not. Trainer's not the right word. Uh, um, oh, God. Um, Handler. It's not a trainer. It's, yeah, they, they have uh, an assistant that guides them. Basically, what they're doing with remote viewing is they use grid coordinates, which those grid coordinates, if you look at it, are grid coordinates on the astral plane. That's my, that's my perspective of it. Now, with astral travel, which is what we do, we travel on the astral plane without the assistance of a, a guide. Um, basically, they use their ability and lock onto the energy pattern of the client using a picture or talking to them on a telephone, and they can be there instantaneously. And they don't just observe. They actually interact, and they can handle whatever we have to handle. Uh, and that's where the difference lies is uh, the remote viewer is straight observation, not interaction. And astral travel, which is what we do, is straight interaction. Everett, do you think there's a big difference between the two? I, I think they share maybe a core of the same abilities, but yeah, I think that they're two entirely different things. I think that somebody who is a psychic may not be able to remote view as well as somebody who's specifically trained as a remote viewer. And I think that somebody who maybe has gone through the program to be trained as a remote viewer may have very little success as a psychic. Markham, what's your thoughts? I do. I think they're different. I, they're related in that it's a non-local phenomenon. You're in one room, but you're seeing something that's happening in another or you're perceiving something that's not in your immediate area. But I think that there are different parts of the, the brain. or it, it just, To me, it seems like they're different, uh, say different, different disciplines completely. I think it would help to be a psychic to be a good remote viewer. I think you could take a, a good, accurate psychic and train them for the remote viewing. And I can't... I'm like, Coop, I cannot remember what you call the person that actually mediates or got a facilitator, maybe? Is that it, Coop? The works yeah, of a remote that, viewer, yeah. facilitator. They got somebody who's actually focusing on the coordinates, and the remote looked, viewer I'm, picks that up. I'm looking, because I posted it on the chat earlier. But I, think, uh, I think a good psychic could be a good remote viewer, but I'm not sure if a good remote viewer could necessarily be a psychic. Well, that is one way to put it. Hey, I do want to remind everyone, because I forgot to advertise it, I'm going on a paranormal investigation tomorrow up here in my area. We're going to investigate an old Royal Canadian Mounted Police building that used to have a morgue underneath it. I think at one time it was a hospital as well. So I'm going to be doing that tomorrow night, and also tomorrow night after that... I'm going to be on the air with Wolfman Mike on Spreaker starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time as we run through a plethora of paranormal experiences. So if anybody here wants to tune in and hear me on the other side of the microphone, that'll be tomorrow night. I'll make sure I get the link up. Uh, so anybody who wants to tune in, not to take away from James Tyson and Elizabeth Anglin's audience, but just in case one or two of you have any interest in what I have to say from the other side of the microphone, I'll, I'll put a link on my Facebook page and on my Twitter feed, so that way you can all tune on in if you feel like you might want to listen. Anyhow, hey, let's get back to tomorrow or last night's show. We were talking with Bruce A. Smith on D.B. Cooper. i got to tell you, there are... A lot of guests that we have on this show that absolutely have me at the edge of my seat. But I damn near fell off yesterday with the information that he was providing on the famous or infamous D.B. Cooper case. Markham, you're the one who booked, Bruce. i got to commend you for that one. That was, a, that was a good, good guest to get, man. I mean, that was three hours of high-impact radio. Yeah, that could have been an over, that could have easily been an OT show. Or that he could have done it if we were on a four-hour format. He could have gone four hours and still kept 
and still there was more there would have been things to discuss. So yeah, I, I hope we see him again. Well, we will be because I booked him again for February oh, that's right. 2nd. February 2nd. We we just absolutely did did not have enough time to get into all the information that we went through last night because man, we could have kept going and going and going. He was like the energizer bunny on the DB Cooper side. But the information that he ha- was presenting, that he really felt that maybe that Cooper, if that was his real name, Dan Cooper, not DB, Dan Cooper, had actually trained on a 727, maybe in the military, to know all the the aspects of how it would fly. Did it sound like a an inside job to you, Everett, when you heard it? I could buy that it was an inside job. I, I could, I could, I could go along with that. I mean, there's so many things that he brought out, and and so many things that came out, and that he talked about that it it's kind of shown that really, while the FBI has closed the case, there's a lot left to look at. Cooper, did you get a chance to tune in last night? No, I didn't. But you know, just the fact that the FBI closed the case makes you wonder. Yeah, I'm wondering why they closed the case as well. Because it seems, you know, maybe they got their man because Bruce last night was absolutely adamant that Cooper survived the parachute jump. And he even surmised that it wasn't about the money. It may have been just an ego thing to see if he could do it and get away with it. But you have to think that he did have some help on the ground to disappear so quickly. Isn't that right, Markham? That's what I'm thinking. And where they talk about where they found money that that had the serial numbers on it, the way he described tying the money, how the guy had the money bag tied to him, I have a feeling he, he dived out of the airplane and got into a dangerous spin or oscillation and had to cut the money bag off of his body to get control so he could, you know, parachute again. But I have no doubt he made it because they would have found something by now. I mean, this is the way they were looking. But it sounds like the way they did the ground search, it's almost like they didn't want, they didn't want to catch him. I think there was some complicity within one of the, you know, the three-letter organizations as far as the D.B. Cooper thing goes. Okay, let's go down that line for a minute then, Eric, because what would be the purpose of doing that? Well, like I said, that that was when all those hijackings were taking place. There wasn't enough regulation, and there didn't seem to be any push from any, any direction to improve the regulations. Or, you know... A feature of this, you get a bunch of guys, say they're all CIA, the kind of guys that flew the drugs, I forgot what the name of that airline in Vietnam was. Now, these guys are getting drunk one night across the table and say, hey, why don't we do this? You know, it just started as a game, a mental exercise, and then they thought, well, hell, why not? We prove we can do it, and we get a million dollars besides, well, $200,000 besides. It could have just been, uh, you know, hey, let's see if we can do this. I, I could see that happening. Coop, how about you? What do you think? Um, well, yeah. But, but <laughs> if they didn't change the regulations, then uh, I, I agree with Markham. Um, the, the, you, you know, it's just like, uh, like you test the waters to see what the security is going to do kind of thing. And then if they didn't fix the security so it didn't happen again, then Mm -hmm. that's where I'd go with that one. Mm -hmm. Everett, what's your feelings on it? Was it an inside job? Yeah, I I can completely accept that, Uh, mostly because, you know, you have to expect that if you're asking for that kind of money, they're going to be running those serial numbers 
So essentially, from the minute you get the money, it's almost useless. So maybe the money isn't a motive. Mm -hmm. If And here's my theory on this. If Eric Markham is right that they were trying to use that to tighten up the lax security that was happening with the airliners, with all these hijackings that were going on in the 60s and 70s, do we not think that maybe, just maybe, D.B. Cooper never jumped off the plane? Maybe he threw his outfit outside and the money outside and maybe changed into a uniform so that way he could he could be one of the um, crew members so to speak i mean there's that possibility too if they, all they were doing was wanting to tighten up the regulations hmm. but then it's not only an inside job it's the crew the whole crew had to be involved in that though it's not just one you know him him doing it to them they have to be involved then well the pilots may not have known the stewardess could have known well, maybe Markham what do you think I think that's one of the things that I thought of when he was talking last night is you set this up you know he could have been a disguise to start with I don't know. I don't think they ruled out that he was on the plane after it landed. I don't think that was... And I'm sure, you know, there had to be places they didn't think to look that a guy could hide. So I'm not altogether convinced if he that he did jump. Mm-hmm. It would make sense if well, he didn't. Uh, what what's odd is you say they closed the case. Usually, doesn't that become a cold case versus a closed case? Well, the FBI has moved resources. What they are saying, but there are still FBI officials locally who are accepting any new information that comes in. So technically, it's okay. a closed okay. case, but it still remains open, so to speak. Gotcha. Okay. Mm hmm. I don't know. I just find this way too interesting, way too intriguing, because I didn't realize, out of all the research that I have done on the topic, that there were that many variables. Add to the fact that the stewardess, Tina Mucklow, won't even talk about it. It's almost like she's been paid to shut up about it. I find that very intriguing Maybe. as well. Maybe she's the one inside. Maybe. Yeah, she could be. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? <clears throat> Who knows? Yeah, it just didn't I seem remember, like that was a lot of money. It seemed like that was a lot of effort and knowledge. Okay, the guy goes in, he's got a working knowledge of the military military configuration of the aircraft to start with, knows mm -hmm. enough about the flight paths to, you know, say no, head toward re Anyhow, he's got enough on the ball. That's a lot of effort to go to go through for $200,000. I mean, and I think that that's, that doesn't seem like that much money, maybe because, you know, yeah. in today's date of trillion-dollar debts, it's it's pocket change in a, in the grand scheme of things, but that, it's like that is not an amount of money that would make authorities stop and say, oh, God, there's no way. It just seemed like a convenient amount of money. Like just a, almost like a token, a token request. It's like, well, we'll make them, you know, we'll show we're serious by asking for money, but not a lot. It just... So much of it seems like good theater mm -hmm. or like a plot line. Like two hundred thousand dollars. Who comes up with that? Usually, it's a hundred grand, a million, ten million, a billion dollars. That's what people are sure, asking well, for. That's a ransom. <laughs> yeah. Oh, coop! It's a monitor. 
that the, uh, the, the person that the person that directs the uh, the uh, remote viewer is called a monitor. Actually, Corey sent it to me earlier. It's a controller. 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 Okay. Yeah. Well, I looked it up. It's called it a monitor. Okay. Yeah, it's a controller. According to the CIA guidebook, I believe it was a controller. Okay. Mm-hmm. I have to look it up again. Yeah, controller is uh, the one that guides them. Okay. Let me ask you guys this, because we've had a lot of topics over this week. The whole study that we did earlier on in the week about parascience. And, Mark, I'm going to bring you on here as our resident scientist. Do you think there will ever come a time where the paranormal and mainstream science can ever find that happy common ground to come together? If they wanted to, yeah. I mean, I'm proof of that. I'm a scientist, but I'm also an experiencer, and I'm willing to use science. You know, I would love to get with a group uh, like Coop's group or, you know, a group that has good, trained, you know, psychics and, you know, those kind of people and do some experiments to validate what's going on. They could, you know... (laughs) <laughs> I'd, I'd love to. I need a clone to stay here and work, do my job so I can do the stuff I want to do. But it, right. I think all it's going to take is that scientist that's willing to reach across the aisle. And there's too many of the, I don't know, I think when you become, a lot of times when you become a scientist, the training beats the wonder out of you. It's like, it's, Eric, let me ask you this. Eric Markham, this is, and and I apologize, Everett and Coop, for kind of focusing on this, but I think this is an important topic. Why are so many scientists, if their job is to prove theory, so afraid to take on the reputation of being the one who proves the paranormal? I don't know. I mean, hell, I'd do it. I think, maybe yeah. Because <laughs> maybe because it's well, French. <clears throat> well, I no. I mean, if 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 fringe scared science to all scientists away, you wouldn't have DARPA. True. So True. it. I think it's a matter of so much of the scientific community is either in academia or in a situation mm-hmm. where. You keep your head down, your ears back. You you publish, and you're you you you're in lockstep with the administration at whatever is laboratory po- you work at. And it's is gonna it possible take somebody, that's not? Is it possible that's not where the money's at? Well, that, yeah, that's true. I mean, it's going to take a uh, you know somebody that's got some bucks to throw around willing to fund that kind of research. They actually did a, uh, they did a similar study to what the guest was talking about here in North Carolina at Duke university. And they had some initial success, but the, it seemed like the more controls they added, the less success they had. It was almost like the, the as they tried to zero in on it, it the abilities would either quit working or the you know it just got down to the range of like random chance. But I do think someday, you know, somebody's going to come up and say, "Hey, we got to get to the bottom of this, throw some money at it, spend some time at it, and." We're going to get some answers. Everett, what's your thoughts on that? Do you think that scientists are afraid to step into the paranormal realm out of the ridicule rather than conduct proper research on something that really can affect mankind just as much as, say, staring into the billions of miles of space to say, oh, look, that little dot up there, that's a planet. 
I think a lot of them are afraid to venture into the paranormal. One, I think it's the ridicule. But two, I think a lot of them, you know, if you're a scientist, there really right now is no way to prove or even scientifically test the paranormal. And I think they may avoid it because really they're just venturing into something that they're not familiar with and they don't, they don't have a set of rules and tools and tests that they can run to prove it. So they might just be feeling like they're spinning their wheels. I can see well, that, Everett. Oh, go ahead, Eric. Well, yeah, I mean, there, what, a lot of times what, what scientists rely on, say you're studying microbiology and you've got an idea. You go through, you get through the journals of the American Society of Microbiology and see if there's some baseline information where you want to go. We don't have that in the paranormal. I mean, you, you, you have anecdotal that people say, well, when a ghost shows up, you get a temperature drop. Well, how much of a temperature drop? Uh, you know, why is there a temperature? You know, none of this stuff is quantified in the paranormal. Somebody's going to have to sit down and actually set, get the baseline information out there, quantified, you know, in an organized manner for other people to refer to before you can ever really do a good scientific study. Somebody's got to lay the groundwork. But the problem with that is uh, when a paranormal group or a paranormal association, if anybody tries to quantify something and try to legitimately present their results, science, the first thing they do is say, well, that's kind of hogwash or, you know, there's nothing to this and they kind of dismiss it and, and move on. So somebody from the scientific community, there needs to be a faction that kind of says, you know what, let's take a look at this and let's see if we can give some legitimacy to their results. I agree. I agree. I think God of Thunder on hashtag Spaced Out Radio on Twitter brings up a very good point, saying mainstream science will never allow itself to recognize the paranormal. It may prove things they don't want to accept. Cooper, what do you think of that? I agree. Um, I, I, I wanted to interject real quick, too. Um, I think scientists that have been in science for long for a longer period of time become, like we were talking earlier, not skeptics but the uh, disbelievers. In that they might even see paranormal and just eh, it's hogwash, like you said, and they don't want to accept the paranormal. Um, but yeah, I, I, I and who's to say the government doesn't have a, a hand on it? Not not proving spirits, but proving the other side of the paranormal. You got so many other aspects of the paranormal that the government's got their hands in that doesn't allow scientists to step in. Well, that might be a very valid point. Markham, I want to bring you in on that one. Do you think there are topics out there that the government does not want covered or brought forward to the public? Because to me, it seems like it would make perfect sense, rather than wasting billions of dollars to find out what is trillions of miles and light years away, why don't we try and prove what's on this planet first? Yeah, and I think one of the problems you have is, okay, you start, you start, you, you find one phenomena, you're the government, and you you get into this and you prove one of these phenomena is real. That's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, it if one's true, more could be true, and eventually you get a pop. You know what I figure is you get this populace of people who are no longer willing to work. You know, toil to their. 60s and then die 10 years later. You know, it once the people get their minds freed up, how easy are they going to be to control? 
I don't think the government wants people to have that kind of mental freedom. Gail has a good well, question. Well, in, let me get to Gail's question first, Coop, and then we'll get to your answer. Okay. Gail, Gail's question kind of ties into this. She says, to pass muster in science, results need to be duplicated by anyone at any time. Perhaps another discipline is needed to prove it. Cooper. Well, like we, like Mark and I have talked before, and uh, we've actually talked on the show before about it. Yeah, all you need to do is get three groups, three different groups, using the same equipment, going into the same, let's say, using concrete, uh, the hub, for example. If we had three different groups go in with the exact same equipment, duplicating the exact same haunting, that right there would be science enough. Um, now, Philadelphia experiment, for example, that was a science experiment, was it not, Markham? Excuse me? The Philadelphia experiment. Yeah, that was, well, that was supposedly trying to make the Eldritch radar invisible. But apparently the device caused a standing wave that actually made the ship teleport to to Norfolk and then come back to the Philly Naval Yard and then phase back in with people mm-hmm. half in and out of decks. But, yeah, there was there was actually a scientific project supposedly at the, at the roots of the Philadelphia experiment. But you can, you can bring in Philadelphia experiment, the Montauk Point project experiments. The, uh, I mean, there's a whole, been a whole lot of government-related, what I would call paranormal experiments, because they're outside the range of normal. And so if they brought science into the paranormal, they would probably uncover a lot of stuff like we talked about that the government wouldn't want exposed. Not just right. simply, who's to say Who's to say if they found out that a spirit we passed on to another realm, that didn't enter the realm of alien? Well, there's another thing. Say, say you proved that Okay, you proved that spirits exist and that they are reliable sources of information. Because in order to validate the spirit, you would have to have a reproducible, an experiment where the same data came through. Well, now all of a sudden, somebody who supposedly died of an accident comes and communicates from the other side. I know those were CIA guys that offed me. Yeah, do you really want? Do you really want your uh, your victims being able to come back or communicate across from the other side and tell on you? So if you validate yeah, it on one hand, then you don't have a leg to stand on when something like that happens. Like, yeah, you know, I, I think there's a lot more government hands in that keep the science out of it um, than we realize. But Everett, isn't well, that... Well, a lot going on. I want to get Everett in here. Everett, isn't that the easy answer, though, is to always blame the government for what they're hiding? Yeah, everybody blames the government for everything. But, you know, in this case, it, there's a lot of different factions or people or groups that may not want the paranormal investigated what would it do to all of the organized religions of the world i mean there's a lot of organized religions that don't really want this investigated why do you think that is after all they are telling people there is life after death all you have to do is follow believe and believe yeah, but what if we found out that everybody can come back as a ghost and do what they want and haunt where they want? Or, you know, what if we found out some answers that showed that whatever you do, you don't have to follow the tenets of any particular organized religion? Then what's the value of religion? If you know that you're going to go on to a life beyond this one, regardless of what religion tells you what's the need for the religion and why does religion cover up stuff i mean look at the the vatican vault look at all the hidden books of the bible that they wouldn't 
disclose because it would show the true beliefs of Christianity and Catholicism, for example. I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of hidden books that have come out that show the church isn't needed, the belief in God is. And exactly. that takes a lot of control out. That takes a lot of the control factors and the manipulation of humans out of the equation. Well, that gets into the whole schism between the Catholics and the Protestants, where the Catholics mm -hmm. believe that the only way you're forgiven for your sins is you've got to come in, tell the priest what you did, and the priest has to intercede with, with God on your behalf. And it's like the Episcopals are like, well, no, God knows you did it. Get, you know, confess to God. You don't have to have that intercessor, that intermediary between yourself and God to, you know, make your soul healthy. So you've got this whole split between two religions. Because I've been to both churches. I grew up Catholic, but I was, I'm married in the Episcopal Church. And I would go to church on Sunday in the Episcopal Church. It's like, well, hell. There's not a nickel's worth of difference between these two. You know, the book's the same, the hymns are the same, the readings are almost, it's almost exactly the same. You just don't have that. You don't have the Pope and you don't have, you don't have to go the right of confession. Ever, do you think that the, relig the religious and governmental fear of not being or not wanting to prove this type or accept this type of theory actually could cause some sort of anarchy if people learn the truth. No, I don't really think it would cause anarchy. I think it would cause, you know, people leaving their religions. I, I think that you know, if we proved ghosts existed, I don't think it's going to change our governmental or, you know, sociological structure that much. Aliens may be a different thing, but I, I in general, I don't, I don't think that would happen. Cooper, what's your thoughts? Uh, yeah, because uh, <laughs> I, I see organized religion. I have no problem with religion in general, but organized religion... Uh, is control. It's a, a fear factor. If you don't do this, you're going to go to hell. If you do that, you're going to go to this wonderful place in the sky. Um, <clears throat> and I, I mean, come, come on. They they keep the true belief of the of, of most of these religions hidden. They they don't let the, they they only let the people know what they want them to know. Um, would it cause anarchy? <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm with Everett on that. I don't think it caused anarchy per se, but it caused a whole lot, a lot, a, a lack of this, a lack of trust on their own religions, and you see people pouring out of that church, and that again, that takes away control. And I think the government, and yeah, I don't care, I'm throwing the government in, but if the if the shoe fits, it, it, I think the governments use churches for a control of the masses, and then you get into the whole elite you know, the, the elite of the government and that kind of thing. And, yeah, anarchy, no, but I, I think it would take their their control of people away. Let's move on here. Because when it comes to parent science, we have a lot of people out there claiming scientific research, as we've gone over many times on this show, what, and I was asked this, this same question on another program that I did an interview with earlier this week. What needs to be proven by people out in the field in order to get the scientific realm to take this seriously? Cooper. What well, needs to be proven? Um... Well, one, that spirits are the embodiment of deceased and not just, you know, random blips of energy, per se. Um, if they can prove that, 
spirits were indeed the passed on, uh, you know, souls of loved ones would be the ultimate. Everett? Proven is a tough, uh, tough word here because I can prove to you anything, whether you accept those results. You know, if you're the sci scientific community and I can prove something to you, it's not really proven until you accept those results. I can prove it all I want. If nobody accepts them, it, it, I'm just a tinfoil wearing hat guy, you know, in my closet. Um, it, it, that's, that's a tough question. I want to get to God of Thunder's point on hashtag space out radio on Twitter. He says, imagine proving conclusively the shroud of Turin was the burial shroud of Christ. A lot of noses would be out of joint. Eric Markham, your thoughts. Hmm. Wow. That would be, <clears throat> There is something to the Shroud of Turin. I mean, I choose to believe that it is. I choose to believe that it is the burial shroud of Jesus Christ. But if you could prove beyond a shadow of a doubt, what does that, you know, what's that going to do to all the other religions? Or the non-Christian religions? Because now all of a sudden you've got proof that, of course, I guess you could prove it is Jesus, and it doesn't necessarily mean Jesus is divine, but... If he's able to flash his image, a reverse of his image, into a linen shroud, that would be something in, in its own right. It would. My mind went down a tangent. Got me back on course here. <laughs> well, we we did have Barry Schwartz on this show a couple of times over the last two years. Here was a man who investigated the shroud, he touched the shroud, he smelled the shroud, he was part of a scientific team testing the shroud. A Jewish man like Schwartz, as he likes to put it, should never believe Jesus Christ exists, yet he believes that shroud is 100% Jesus Christ. Well, yeah, I mean, well, Jesus was a Jew, so I mean, I can, the, the difference, taking the historical... Jesus and the Christ or the Messiah, the two different things. I mean, I think they've actually proven that there was a Jesus who was a rabbi. You know, I'm not sure how much, how far they're willing to go, but it does seem like that they found some Roman records where they crucified a guy named Jesus. But then you've got the mythic overlay or the religious overlay, whichever your point of view is, where he wasn't just Jesus. He was an immaculate conception. He was a you know miracle worker and the son of, you know a physical incarnation of God. The shroud of Turin in itself, even if you prove that this is the bearer cloth of Jesus Christ, isn't the same as proving that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. So it would still be, you'd, you'd still have the unanswered question. Mm -hmm. I want to get to... It, it, it valid, go ahead, it, it validates the Bible. It validates the Bible. Well, I think just finding that they there was a historic, there was an actual Jesus, or Yah right. Yahshua, validates some of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And that they're talking about, you know, they're talking about this man. He's in the Bible and he actually existed. It's the overlay on top of that, the part that you have to take on faith. So, you know, they can they could say that, okay, yes, this is this is the the burial. The, this is the shroud of Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth. That still mm -hmm. doesn't mean that he was an incarnation of God. You know that. Well, they they, they also different. found they they found Noah's Ark on Mount Ararat. I mean, and if I if I recall right, they actually proved that those boards and whatnot were from the same era and were the Ark of you know Noah's Ark. So I mean, the, the Bible 
itself is validated by, by a, a lot of uh, historical documentation. Well, it's something that's been written as history happened. Mm -hmm. There right. would you, you're going to have places where there's an agreement with. I think they've actually figured out that the uh, oh, there was a day that like the, the sun stood still or something. The, the one of those biblical things. It seems like astronomers actually proved that there was a day that the sun stayed in the sky all day. Some Oh, God, I wish I could remember. They actually talked. It was actually part of my uh, graduation. When I graduated high school, the pr the principal was, or the administrator was bringing up this story, how science had proved some of the pieces of the Bible. I mean, there's been pieces of the Bible that have been, they found some historical evidence for. But as far mm -hmm. as the whole Noah's Ark thing, if you look at all all the all the I say like Mesopotamian culture, you've got you've got the Noah's Ark over there, but you also have mm -hmm. a flood mythology in South America. You have flood you you have these great flood stories in several diverse cultures, but then look where people lived. They lived in the floodplains where, you know, the, you know, they're in the floodplains of the Nile Valley because that's where the good soil, the fertile soil is. These cultures tended to, grow, to be in flood-prone areas. So all you have to do is have one really good, you know, epic storm that creates this hellacious flood and it's going to be in, you know, it's going to, all these different cultures are going to have a flood myth. Plus there's also, it's in the Mediterranean, they think at one time the Mediterranean Sea was actually dry, that it was, uh, it was actually closed off from the Atlantic Ocean, and that there was people living in that basin when the rocks, Oh, over by Gibraltar, some kind of cataclysm cracked open what was actually keeping the Atlantic out of the Med, and that whole area became, uh, you ended up having oceanfront prop property in Jerusalem, you know, <laughs> because the sea came in through uh, the fissure. So it's not, uh, you know, having, you're going to have these, these stories and these cultures about the different different floods. Mm -hmm. Let's move on here, guys. I want to get to uh, Ron Monia's question. And, Ev, we're going to start with you. He says, The paranormal does not offer the same economic value as mainstream science. Paranormal cannot be corporized. What is your thoughts on that? I think uh, there's several TV networks that have corporized uh, paranormal quite well. I mean, it's, it's been turned into entertainment. Um, can you make a profit? I, 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 we've all had this discussion before about, you know, if you're going in to investigate somebody's house, you really shouldn't be taking money, that kind of thing. But I mean, it can be corporized. Uh, there's several, I think there's several new shows coming out that prove it. Um, but yeah, there's not a there, there's not a big profit motive in genuine, real parapsychological or paranormal research. Do you think there should be? I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, there's no experts out there. So if you go to somebody's house, how can how how does somebody determine whether you're worth being paid or not? Uh, it, it's kind of hard to kind of hard to make those delineations. So I, I, right now, I don't think there should be. What's? Do you think? No, it's it, it, Oops, it's impossible to it, it's impossible to you you can remove one spirit from a client's house and you can't guarantee it. Another three more won't come in. So there's it's impossible to verify. 
And the more you try and put a profit motive into it, the more you're going to get amateurs going around claiming they're experts right. and, and really just making the field worse. Eric Markham, what's your thoughts? Is there a, a way that people can monetize and corporize this? Not ethically, I don't think. Because once you have to make a profit or once once it becomes a business, you have to have an outcome. You go, okay, you're going to charge somebody $200, come in, clean their house, they come in, they basically, you're going to have to, the client's going to expect some kind of hocus pocus. I mean, if, when you, if you try and monetize this, it's just going to open it up for fraud. I mean, even if you yep. had a baseline of information where you could go in and say, okay, you're haunted because this, this, and this, you know, these criteria are met, these scientific criteria are met, this place is haunted. You could go in with your equipment in such a way to make it look like the criteria are fixed, charge the client $200, and you haven't done anything. So if you monetize it, you're the potential and the motivation for creating fraud is going to be far more than it already is. So I don't, yeah, I don't think there's an ethical way to corporatize it. Not if you had a government sanction, okay? And I'm not saying on a federal level, I'm saying on a state or municipal level or up here a provincial level where you were doing it on a tourism type of capitalism. Well, then, yeah, okay, if you're talking about, like, a haunted site, I think you can corporatize some, a place that, a reliably haunted site, yes, maybe then. You know, in that kind of instance, yes, you can corporatize it. I was maybe thinking too narrowly, just, I don't think you're going to be able to corporatize it in the investigative side, but maybe just as a site. A, a site where there's activity and then again though you you still run into that if people are paying their money they want to see something i'm afraid if you if like take a say a reliably haunted site well even the most reliable haunting is not 100 percent all the time you start getting people paying their money you're going to get the same kind of fraudulent activity that the ghost shows, the producers of these ghost shows had to throw in to keep the entertainment going. Somebody pays 20 bucks to come into the haunted bar and doesn't get a bar glass thrown at them, or what, you know, doesn't have something happen, they're going to want their money back. So if you're trying to corporatize anything like this, you're going to have to, it's, 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 the seeds of the fraud are inherent in the, in the model. They're just, I can't think of a business model that wouldn't, create fraud. Everett, what's your thoughts? I think ethically it's kind of exploitation if if you do something like that. If you have a house that's haunted and you know so many paranormal researchers and investigators, you know, they talk about how we need to treat the spirits like people and, and we need to be respectful of them. Well, it's not very respectful of you if all of a sudden you're making $25 a head to have somebody, you know, trounce through a place to see a spirit move a glass or knock on a wall or do something like that. True enough, but I guess it comes down to sanctioning. If you cannot sanction these groups... But if you're going to sanction a group, that kind of implies that there are certain criteria that are met to a investigate and b exactly. that that the house has been proven there's some criteria to prove that the house has been haunted or mm -hmm. the building has been haunted and then we go right back to science and the paranormal community kind of need to make some compromises and figure out where that line is what what those experiments are what that what that base data is Mm -hmm. 
Eric Cooper, Ron Moniak makes a good point in the SOR Space Travelers Club. He is saying paranormal for most is a passing fad. You can't sell it like research for diseases or even the common cold. Big money passes there. And totally agree. Um, it, it is a passing fad for most. Um, we, I mean, we've proven that before with all the groups that are they 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 watch ghost hunters or they watch paranormal TV and oh, it's exciting for a minute and then uh, well, they've got their picture, they got their EVP. Well, they didn't get nothing and they figure, oh, okay, well, it's fake. And they drop out. They, they they disappear. So it is a passing fad for most. But then you got groups that know it know it exists. They have they have no need to prove it. Or the ones that have seen enough that they keep on going. So yeah, it's a passing fad for most. Are we ever going to get science involved? I think it would take a whole lot to get science involved. And, uh, and like Everett said. You would have to have uh, you would have to have a baseline to get any group sanctioned legally, other than a five hundred one c three under education or religion, or uh, you know something like that to be a five hundred one c three, which would make you legal. But mm. and, and that's where we stand, gentlemen. I got to wrap this thing up. I want to say thank you, Everett and Eric Squared, for coming in for hour number three. Tonight on the Mighty SOR, I got my bag packed, I've got my boots on, my toque, it's not a beanie, it's a toque, my gloves, everything's ready. I'm heading off into the mountains, find my zen, my chi, maybe that cougar that Mike is hunting down, it's killing all the cattle on the farmer's land, I'm going to look for it. Don't forget, tomorrow night and Saturday, or Sunday, Uncle Jimbo James Tyson along with Elizabeth Anglin will be in for Space Out Weekend, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern Time. If you're listening in on the Space Out Radio side, you hear Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal, formerly of Guns N' Roses. He is our music man, our music myth, and our music legend, taking us in and out of every single show right here on the Mighty SOR. Rock with Bumblefoot if you can. We'd appreciate it. Remember, you can listen to this show and others on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show, on TuneIn, Spaced Out Radio, and on iTunes, Spaced Out Radio. I will be back on Monday with the boys from Chronicles of the Unknown. Good to have you along for the ride, people. It's been a good, solid week. Let's do it again. Remember, tell a friend. That's the way we're going to grow this thing bigger and better. i got big plans for 2017. I need your help. Tell your friends. Have a good one. Bye-bye.